The House will come to order. <laughs> Prayer by the chaplain. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather today. We thank you for the United States of America, one nation under God. We thank you for our freedom and representation and prosperity. We thank you for the state of Minnesota, our beautiful home. And to God, we thank you for these representatives today, their diversity, the districts that they represent, their love for Minnesota, and their desire to make it thrive. Today, I pray for their meeting, for their unity and decision-making, for their productivity, their agenda, their order, and their process. And I pray for the well-being of our residents, that these leaders that you've given us would have wisdom to make the correct decisions to lead us well. I pray, God, that you would be honored in the discourse today, when we agree and when we disagree, and that you would go before them in all the things on their agenda, everything that they need to discuss today. Would you give them wisdom that they don't have? And it's in your name that we pray today. Amen. Amen. The chaplain for today is Pastor Mark Katzenberger from Transform Church, Andover, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members, when the chief clerk calls the roll today to establish a quorum, please state your name, your location, that you are present. Members using the remote voting application should also press the green yay button when their name is called. The clerk will take the roll. Akam. Akam Minnetonka present. Akam Minnetonka present. Agbadje. Agbadje Minneapolis present. Agbadje Minneapolis present. Ackland. Ackland St. Paul present. Ackland St. Paul present. Albright. Albright St. Paul present. Anderson. Anderson Barsness Township present. Anderson Barsness Township present. Backer. Backer, Browns Valley present. Backer, Browns Valley present. Bonner. Bonner, St. Paul present. Bonner, St. Paul present. Barr. Barr, East Bethel present. Barr, East Bethel present. Baker. Baker, St. Paul present. Becker Finn. Becker Finn, Roseville present. Becker Finn, Roseville present. Bennett. Bennett, St. Paul present. Bennett, St. Paul present. Berg. Berg, St. Paul, present. Bernardi. Bernardi, New Brighton, present. Bernardi, New Brighton, present. Beerman. Beerman, Apple Valley, present. Beerman, Apple Valley, present. Bliss. Bliss, Beltrami County, present. Bliss, Beltrami County, present. Bo. Bo, Carver County, present. Bo, Carver County, present. Bolden. Bolden. Burkle. Burkle, Skagen Township, present. Burkle, Skagen Township, present. Carlson. Carlson, St. Paul, present. Carlson, St. Paul, present. Christensen. Christensen, Stillwater, present. Christensen, Stillwater, present. Daniels. Daniels, Fairbolt, present. Daniels, Fairbolt, present. Doubt. Doubt, St. Paul, present. Doubt, St. Paul, present. Davids. David, St. Paul, present. Daphne. Daphne, Minneapolis, present. Daphne, Minneapolis, present. Damoth. Damoth, St. Paul, present. Detmer. Detmer, Forest Lake, present. Detmer, Forest Lake, present. Dreskowski. Dreskowski, Winona, present. Dreskowski, Winona, present. Eklund. Eklund, St. Paul, present. Eklund, St. Paul, present. Edelson. Edelson Edina present. Edelson Edina present. Elkins. Elkins Bloomington present. Elkins Bloomington present. Erickson. Erickson Bloomington 
Erickson, St. Paul, present. Erickson, St. Paul, present. Feist. Feist, New Brighton, present. Feist, New Brighton, present. Fisher. Fisher, St. Paul, present. Frankie. Frankie, St. Paul, present. Franzen. Franzen, St. Paul, present. Franzen, St. Paul, present. Frazier. Frazier, Hennepin County, present. Frazier, Hennepin County, present. Frederick. Frederick, St. Paul, present. Frederick, St. Paul, present. Freiburg. Freiburg, St. Paul, present. Freiburg, St. Paul, present. Garofalo. Garofalo, Dakota County, present. Garofalo, Dakota County, present. Gomez. Um, Sorry, two weeks early. Yeah, I'm kind of like thinking it's Gomez. Pamela, you're unmuted. Gomez, Minneapolis, present. Gomez, Minneapolis, present. Green. Green, Monoman County, present. Green, Monoman County, present. Greenman. Greenman, St. Paul, present. Grossel. Grossel, St. Paul, present. Grossel, St. Paul, present. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, St. Paul, present. Haley. Haley. Hamilton. Hamilton, St. Paul, present. Hamilton, St. Paul, present. Hanson R. Hanson R. Harmony, present. Hanson R. Harmony, present. Hanson J. Hanson J. St. Paul, present. Hassan. Hassan, Minneapolis, present. Hassan, Minneapolis, present. Houseman. Houseman, St. Paul, present. Houseman, St. Paul, present. Heinrich. Heinrich, St. Paul, present. Heinrich, St. Paul, present. Heinzman. Heinzman, Niswa, present. Heinzman, Niswa, present. Her. Her. Hertas. Hertas, Greenfield, present. Hertas, Greenfield, present. Hollins. Hollins, St. Paul, present. Hollins, St. Paul, present. Hornstein. Hornstein, Minneapolis, present. Hornstein, Minneapolis, present. Howard. Howard. Hewitt. Hewitt, St. Paul, present. Eigel. Igo, St. Paul, present. Igo, St. Paul, present. Johnson. Johnson, St. Paul, present. Johnson, St. Paul, present. Jordan. All present. Jordan, Minneapolis, present. Jordan, Minneapolis, present. Jurgens. Jurgens, St. Paul, present. Jurgens, St. Paul, present. Keeler. Keeler, St. Paul, present. Keel. Keel, Crookston, present. Keel, Crookston, present. Cleavorn. Cleavorn, Plymouth. Present. Cleavorn, Plymouth, present. Kegel. Kegel, Spring Lake Park, present. Kegel, Spring Lake Park, present. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, Eden Prairie, present. Katiza Watoon, Eden Prairie, present. Kosnick. Kosnick, Lakeville, present. Kosnick, Lakeville, present. Creshaw. Creshaw, St. Paul, present. Creshaw, St. Paul, present. Lee. Lee, St. Paul, present. Lee, St. Paul, present. Liebling. Lieblings, St. Paul, present. Liebling, St. Paul, present. Lily. Lily, Maplewood, present. Lily, Maplewood, present. Lippert. Lippert, Northfield, present. Lippert, Northfield, present. Lislagard. Lislagard, St. Paul, present. Lislagard, St. Paul, present. Long. Long, Minneapolis, present. Long, Minneapolis, present. Lucero. Lucero. Lucero, Wright County, present. Lucero, Wright County, present. Lewick. Lewick, St. Paul, present. Lewick, St. Paul, present. Mariani. Mariani, St. Paul, present. Mariani, St. Paul, present. Markwart. Markwart, Dilworth, present. Markwart, Dilworth, present. Mason. Mason, Egan, present. Mason, Egan, present. McDonald. McDonald Delano present. McDonald Delano present. Mecklen. Mecklen, Sherburn County present. Mecklen, Sherburn County present. Miller. Miller, St. Paul present. Moeller. Moeller, Shoreview present. Moeller, Shoreview present. Moran. Moran. 
Morrison. Morrison, Deep Haven, present. Morrison, Deep Haven, present. Mortensen. Mortensen, St. Paul, present. Mortensen, St. Paul, present. Mueller. Mueller, St. Paul, present. Munson. Munson, Lincoln Township, present. Munson, Lincoln Township, present. Murphy. Murphy, Two Harbors, present. Murphy, Two Harbors, present. Nash. Nash, Waconia, present. Nash, Waconia, present. Nelson M. Nelson M, Brooklyn Park, present. Nelson M, Brooklyn Park, present. Nelson N. Nelson N, Clover Township, present. Nelson N, Clover Township, present. New Brindley. New Brindley, St. Paul, present. Noor. Noor, Minneapolis, present. Noor, Minneapolis, present. Novotny. Novotny, St. Paul, present. O'Driscoll. Excused. Olson B. Olson B. Faribault County, present. Olson B. Faribault County, present. Olson L. Olson L. St. Paul, present. O'Neill. Excused. Palowski. Palowski, Winona, present. Palowski, Winona, present. Petersburg. Petersburg, Wasika, present. Petersburg, Wasika, present. Far. Far, Lesueur, present. Far, Lesueur, present. Pearson. Pearson, St. Paul, present. Pinto. Pinto, Little Falls, present. Pinto, Little Falls, present. Poston. Poston, Lakeshore, present. Poston, Lakeshore, present. Pryor. Pryor, Minnetonka, present. Pryor, Minnetonka, present. Quam. Quam, St. Paul, present. Raleigh. Raleigh, St. Paul, present. Raleigh, St. Paul, present. Rasmussen. Rasmussen, St. Paul, present. Ryer. Ryer, Egan. Ryer, Egan, present. Richardson. Richardson, Mendota Heights, present. Richardson, Mendota Heights, present. Robbins. Robbins, St. Paul, present. Sandell. Sandell, Woodbury, present. Sandell, Woodbury, present. Sandstead. Sandstead, Hibbing, present. Sandstead, Hibbing, present. Schumacher. Schumacher. Schumacher, St. Paul, present. Schultz. Schultz, St. Paul, present. Schultz, St. Paul, present. Scott. Scott, Andover, present. Scott, Andover, present. Stevenson. Stevenson, St. Paul, present. Sundin. Sundin, Pine County, present. Sundin, Pine County, present. Swazinski. Swazinski, St. Paul, present. Swazinski, St. Paul, present. Tice. Tice, St. Cloud, present. Tice, St. Cloud, present. Thompson. Thompson, St. Paul, present. Thompson, St. Paul, present. Torkelson. Torkelson, Hanska, present. Torkelson, Hanska, present. Erdahl. Erdahl, St. Paul, present. Erdahl, St. Paul, present. Vang. Vang, Brooklyn Center, present. Vang, Brooklyn Center, present. Waslowick. Waslowick, St. Paul, present. West. West Blaine, present. West Blaine, present. Winkler. Winkler, St. Paul, present. Walgamont. Walgamont, St. Paul, present. Zhang J. Zhang J, St. Paul, present. Zhang J, St. Paul, present. Zhang T. Zhang Chi, St. Paul, present. Zhang Chi, St. Paul, present. Joachim. Joachim Hopkins, present. Joachim Hopkins, present. Speaker Hartman. Speaker Hartman, St. Paul, present. Speaker Hartman, St. Paul, present. Bolden. Bolden, Rochester, present. Bolden, Rochester, present. Haley. Haley. Her. Her, Howard, Howard, St. Paul, present. Moran. Moran, St. Paul, present. Moran, St. Paul, present. The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal for the preceding day. 
Journal of the House, 92nd Session, 2021, 45th Day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with and the journal will be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Comparison reports. A copy of this order of business is online. If there is no objection, the motions will prevail. Hearing no objection, the motions prevail and the substitutions will be made. Reports on standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business is online. If there is no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. Second reading, of how, second reading of Senate files. Second reading of Senate file number 151. Second reading. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House files 2564 through 2571. First reading of House Files 2564 through 2571. Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message from the Senate. Madam Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file. Herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 1684, an act relating to, to transportation. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Hornstein moves that the House refuse to concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 1684, that the Speaker appoint a conference committee of five members of the House, and that the House requests that a like committee be appointed by the Senate to confer on the disagreeing votes of the two Houses. The maker of the motion, Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That is my motion. Uh, there are a number of provisions with which we disagree, and the conference committee would be appropriate to work out those differences. Here you go. I ask for your support. Discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Report from the Committee on Rules and Legislative... We don't have one today. Oh, never mind, it's not on the agenda. <laughs> calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 2128. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 2128, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to state government, health, health care, and health and human services, the third engrossment. There are amendments at the desk. With no objection, we will let the author explain the bill before we act on the amendments. And Representative Liebling, I know there is also an author's amendment. We should get to that first as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would prefer to uh, wait with the author's amendment until we get through the introduction of the bill, if that's all right. That's just fine. This is the amendment here. That's just the yeah. bill. You can give me that, that first. That yes. yes. Oh. I recognize the author of the bill, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. What a year it has been in Minnesota and in the world. I don't have to tell any of you, we have seen COVID ravage our nation. We've had about 32 million cases in our country and now over 568,000 deaths from the disease. This pandemic has shown a spotlight on the importance of having a robust public health system and on the systemic inequities that exist in our state. 
we know that Minnesotans really do care about each other and want to live in a state where everyone, no matter what they look like, how they worship, who they love, no matter where they come from, can live a full and healthy life. The health portion of this bill, which is what I'm addressing now, really moves us in that direction. And it does it in a number of ways. It invests in public health infrastructure to address our ongoing challenges and meet new ones as they arise, especially among communities that have experienced the worst disparities. It builds a better healthcare system to help all Minnesotans lead healthier lives and receive the care they need when they need it. It invests in children and families to reduce disparities and give all our kids the best possible start in life. And it invests in improving dental care for almost 20% of Minnesotans who are on our public health care programs. And importantly, it reduces the cost of prescription drugs. You are going to hear a lot more about these issues in the bill from other members of our team. But before we get to them, I just would like to do a few thank yous. As everyone knows, a bill like this is the work of many people. And I am so extremely proud of the team that has worked to get us to this point. I would like to call out the vice chair for health finance and policy, my, my uh, partner in this endeavor, Representative John Hewitt and the other members of the Health Finance and Policy Committee who have all worked so hard. Every single one has made valuable contributions to the committee and many provisions in this bill. Joe Durheim, our DFL researcher for Health and Human Services has done an outstanding job. And I especially wanna thank Representative Jen Schultz who's just been a wonderful colleague at every step of the way. Um, very importantly, I want to thank my, the Republican lead for the committee, Joe Schumacher, and the Republican researcher, Jeremiah Winstad. Thank you so much for being flexible as we work to find new ways to do our work during this really challenging and unique year. This work of uh, this year of working remotely has been extremely difficult for our top notch, nonpartisan House staff who uphold the highest standards, even in a pandemic, and make all of this possible. Randall Chun, Sarah Sunderman, Elizabeth Clarkvist, Danielle Punelli, Punelli, I'm sorry, and of course, our fiscal staff, Doug Berg, who all of them just amaze us with their skill, their dedication, and their hard work. Also, the staff at the revisor's office who often work behind the scenes, but have done great work this session. Um, Commissioner Malcolm from the Department of Health and Commissioner Harpstead from DHS, Department of Human Services, have been wonderful partners. And they have amazing people in those agencies who work so hard every day to improve the lives of Minnesotans. And I would especially like to call out Lisa Timion with MDH and Matthew Burdick, with DHS who lead their legislative teams and just work night and day to, to help us and to make this state do its great work. And finally, a big thank you to all of the DFL staff who worked as a team to make this come together, especially Chris McCall for all the times he has stepped up to help us uh, when he really didn't have to, uh, just going outside his job description to do whatever was needed. Uh, my wonderful legislative assistant, Krista Niedernhofer, has just been terrific this year, as always, in these challenging circumstances. And then there's my committee administrator, Patrick McQuillan. He is simply the best. Their hours and hours of work behind the scenes make all of this look easy. But as you know, it really isn't easy at all. And now, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to... Um, have you call on some of the other members of Team HHS who will tell you more about our terrific bill, House File 2128. Thank you. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Freiburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past year has shown the importance of a strong public health infrastructure and the importance of a focus on preventive health that is grounded in principles of equity. This bill will help us come out of a very difficult year stronger than ever. 
the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted how much Minnesotans count on affordable, high-quality health care. As we look to the future of our state after this crisis, this bill takes what we've learned over the past year and tackles the challenges Minnesotans have encountered and will build a better health care system. Minnesotans value health and well-being, but BIPOC communities face persistent health inequities. This bill helps close these unacceptable gaps by improving opportunities for preventive care, strengthening prenatal and maternal health, addressing environmental factors that lead to poor health outcomes, and increasing public health outreach to underserved communities. This bill will build our public health infrastructure through a substantial investment in local public health and will replenish the public health contingency account. The bill also includes COVID-19 vaccine distribution provisions that aim to promote equitable distribution. It deals with issues that were heard in the Preventive Health Policy Division. First, in Minnesota, women who qualify for medical assistance due to pregnancy only receive coverage for 60 days postpartum. This bill expands coverage for pregnant women from 60 days postpartum to 12 months. We also heard testimony in the division about the risks of lead exposure, and the bill includes provisions strengthening lead assessments. Several other provisions focus on prevention and will benefit public health. One provision allows the Department of Health to use strong health risk limits for groundwater contaminants. Another will establish a pilot program to aid in the reduction of trauma resulting from gun violence and will help address the root causes of gun violence. One provision will fund a grant program to increase public awareness on the health dangers associated with using skin lightening creams and products that contain mercury. In short, this is a great bill that will support our public health infrastructure, advance equity, and address numerous important preventive health measures. Thank you to Lindy Somick, Laura Taken-Holtze, Eric Anderson, Chelsea Olson, Elizabeth Clarkvist, and all the staff who make our work possible. This bill has provisions authored by numerous representatives, but of the provisions I mentioned, they were authored by representatives Hassan, Jordan, Lee, Morrison, and Wolgamot. So thank you to them as well. Thank you also to the Republican lead on the Preventive Health Policy Division, Representative Grunhagen. We don't always agree on issues, but it's been a lot of fun working to, with you and getting to know you better this year. I encourage members to support this important bill, and thank you for your time. The representative from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the honor it has been to serve on the Health and Human Service, uh, the Health Committee this year, and to have such a great leader in uh, Chair Liebling. We focused on building better health care systems this year, and I want to thank both sides of the aisle for that. We had some robust discussions in our committee, but real, realistically, our goal was the same, to make health care better in Minnesota. A bill that Chair Liebling sponsored basically looked at Hennepin County Medical Center as, Hennep first of all, you have to understand Hennepin County Medical Center is the catch-all. It's not only the catch-all for Hennepin County, it's the catch-all for the state of Minnesota. Most counties depend on them. They have a hypobaric chamber, but they also do a lot of indigent care for all counties in Minnesota. And Chair Liebling's bill basically created a safety net for them. Chair Richardson put together a bill that basically helps fund paid family leave for our nursing home workers. We know that they're the ones struggling the most. They were there during COVID. They helped their patients. Yet, they're some of the lowest paid employees. So we were able, to, in our bill, to put together a provision that would help the nursing homes pay for the paid family leave. Another great part of our bill is Representative Her's part, where she was able to work with Regions Hospital to add more mental health beds and other beds. Regions Hospital also is a catch-all for the state and 20 more mental health beds is going to make a big difference at Regions. The other thing that we uh, in our bill is Representative Lippert and Fisher's bill to improve the cumbersome bed moratorium law in Minnesota. The other thing in one of the bills I granted was bill, a bill that would help all our critical access hospitals in our rural hospitals throughout the state. Many times they get patients that they can't handle. But this bill provides training as it has through many years. It's called the Comprehensive Advanced Life Support uh, Bill. And it trains our ERs all over the state 
to take on those bigger cases until they can get a helicopter or a ground ambulance there to move the patient to True Sherry Care. The other part of our bill is a provision that basically um, rebases the rates for our federal qualified health care centers. Lastly, Representative Morrison, in which we all have heard in the short time I've been in office, basically the timely credentialing of our health care providers by our health plans. This is a real great bill that will help our providers get in to get credentialed quicker so our health plans can get the, so they can get the much needed reimbursement. So members, I think we are in for a good day. This will be a great bill. Thank you. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I'm very proud of the HHS omnibus that Chairs Liebling, Schultz, Freiburg, Fisher, and Gomez have put together. It's full of policy initiatives that are designed to address challenges that we face in Minnesota. This has been an unprecedented year in our state and it created new challenges and exacerbated some of the problems and disparities that have long existed. Last summer, the House declared racism a public health crisis and the House Select Committee on Racial Justice released its report and recommendations. Several provisions in this omnibus reflect and support the work of the committee and include many of the committee's recommendations. We have unacceptable maternal and infant mortality disparities in Minnesota, and several of the bills in the omnibus address that crisis head on. House File 521 extends medical assistance to 12 months postpartum from its current 60 days. Minnesota has long prided itself on its low uninsured rates, and this has been an overlooked gap for too long. For babies to get off to the best possible start in life, their mothers and parents must have access to the health care they need to be healthy and thrive. There's a bipartisan push to get this done in Minnesota, and I want to thank Representative Albright for co-authoring this legislation with me, and Senator Melissa Wickland and Senator Michelle Benson for their bipartisan leadership in the Senate. I also want to highlight Representative Ruth Richardson's work as co-chair of the Select Committee on Racial Justice and her work to address the disparities in maternal and infant mortality. Representative Richardson authored the Dignity and Pregnancy and Childbirth Act, which will initiate several improvements, including expanding access to culturally competent midwifery and doula care, requiring anti-racism and implicit bias training in hospitals and birth centers, and adding studies of maternal morbidity to maternal mortality studies so that the near misses can be studied to assist in the planning, implementation, and evaluation of medical health and welfare service systems in order to reduce the numbers of preventable adverse maternal outcomes. The growing recognition of the urgency of making these changes spans the political spectrum as evidenced by the unanimous vote in the Health Finance Committee when this bill was heard. We know that the COVID pandemic has laid bare and worsened the inequities that exist in our society. We also know that the pandemic has adversely and disproportionately impacted the BIPOC communities in Minnesota with more severe illness, hospitalization, and death. Given that reality, Representative Jay Zhang and I led an effort to improve vaccine equity so that the populations most at risk for serious outcomes have access to the vaccines. Minnesota has a remarkable Department of Health that does incredible work. But House File 2113 also recognizes the importance of funding a robust public health system so that we are better prepared for the next public health emergency so that all Minnesotans will be protected. Lastly, I wanna highlight the bipartisan Minnesota Telehealth Act. Telehealth has emerged as one of the few silver linings of this past year. Patients and providers quickly learned that the telehealth expansions put into place to meet the moment with COVID had many benefits to patients. It adds convenience and saves them time and money. It meets patients where they are, enabling them to get care from home or where they, wherever they prefer to be if they so choose. And it includes telephone, which reaches people who don't have access to video or prefer more privacy or don't have shelter. This helps people in greater Minnesota who don't have reliable broadband or easy access to care and helps address disparities and equity in terms of access to care. And I wanna publicly thank Senator Julie Rosen for her partnership on this effort. I am so proud of the provisions in this omnibus bill, which would make positive changes in the lives and health of Minnesotans across the state. And I hope you will all join me in voting green. 
The representative from Hennepin, Representative Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. This bill is a reflection of our values, of who we are. It impacts the lives of many of our most vulnerable. It defies ethnicity and geography. And the issues we touch here impact every corner of the state, every income level, every man, woman, and child among us. This bill leaves no family and no child behind. It is at its essence about improving the health and well-being essential to move beyond the disparities laid bare over the past year and to allow the crisp, clean sunshine back in once again so we can all thrive. This bill makes clear we value the need for families to have the ability to care for their loved ones in their time of need, from new moms and dads celebrating the joy of a new life, to caring for a parent in the twilight of theirs. But nothing could be more precious than where families begin. This bill invests in healthy moms and healthy babies seeking to improve infant and maternal health. It expands postpartum care in the most fragile of times, the 12 months after that precious life emergence, perfect, tender, and beautiful. It expands access to home visiting programs, which have the power to shape futures by shaping and nurturing the families who are most at risk due to poverty, language barriers, substance abuse, and often lack the skills to model nurturing behaviors. This bill aligns the standards for foster care and adoption to keep children and families together, where their bonds are the strongest and where their shared history means love that lasts a lifetime. We expand the care and treatment for children with asthma, giving the gift of fresh air and a better quality of life. With this bill, we have an opportunity to profoundly impact change, to set the stage for success in life, closing the door on gaps before they start. This bill has the power to mold generations to come by keeping families whole, healthy, and thriving. It has the power to improve the health and well-being of our most precious gift, our families and our children. Thank you, members. The representative from Dakota, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members, and thank you to Chair Liebling, my colleagues on the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee, and the amazing House staff. I'm proud to speak about the dental provisions in this bill. When our mouths aren't healthy, we aren't healthy. Many of us are fortunate to have access to the dental care we need, but too many go without the preventive care and treatment that is essential to good health. This is a pressing problem in our public, uh, public health care programs, especially for children. Only 37% of kids saw a dentist in 2016 or 2017. Members, nearly two thirds went without basic care. This problem disproportionately affects the BIPOC community and is an equity issue. In this bill, we're committed to achieving better dental care for all Minnesotans on public programs. We'll do this by simplifying the systems, improving reimbursement, and opening doors to service delivery innovation. First simplification. Our public programs dental system is extremely complex with many players, levels of administration, and reimbursement variations. It's confusing to dentists who often don't even know what they'll be paid for their services. We address this in part by engaging a third-party administrator to provide the dental services directly rather than working through the managed care companies. 
This also provides much needed transparency to the dentists as well as to the legislature. Now on to reimbursement. Rates are one of the biggest problems. We are one of the lowest paying states in the nation, so many dentists can't afford to provide these services. This bill revises the rate structure, starting with rebasing payment from using 1999 actuals to 2018 actuals. You heard that right, reimbursement is based on data that is more than 20 years old. Think about how much the profession has changed and you can see the problem. We also remove complexity in payment, raising the rates while taking out most supplemental payments, only keeping a payment add-on for the critical access dentists who provide a majority of the care to this population. Finally, through the Dental Home Homes Demonstration Project, we recognize the value of the innovative approaches that are used successfully across Minnesota, especially by certified access dentists, and the need to develop and expand these service models that meet the patients where they are. Members, I look forward to seeing these changes come to pass so that everyone in our state gets the dental care they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker? Yes, for what purpose do you rise? Well, Mr. Speaker, my point of order is what point, what uh, order of business are we on here? Normally when we have an omnibus bill, the author of the bill produces or uh, introduces the bill and then we're going to amendments. What we're doing here is hearing a bunch of canned speeches. Uh, this is, uh, is this allowable uh, under the bill introduction here? Uh, Representative Davids, it's my understanding that these members are simply representing different parts of the bill. The representative from Dakota, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. I first just uh, want to say a thank you to Chair Liebling and Chair Schultz, uh, Chair Schultz for all of your work in crafting this bill. It is a monumental task, and I know that the entire body recognizes your dedication and labor and expertise in the field. While it is not possible to address all the needs in one bill, this will make a tremendous impact for the improvement of health for Minnesotans. And I just wanna highlight two items in the bill, both with bipartisan support. Periodontal care addresses gum disease. Currently, non-surgical treatment is not covered under medical assistance was discontinued in an effort to save money. Members, this was short-sighted. Untreated periodontal disease turns into emergency room visits. When gum disease is not treated, disease gets worse. It infects the jaw, spreads to the cardiovascular system, and creates, creates heart maladies and chronic conditions, which ultimately result in much bigger costs. The largest portion of the healthcare budget is in treating chronic conditions. The way to save money is to treat people when issues first appear, early, on the front end. Reinstating this care is sensible, cost-effective, and will deliver better overall health for Minnesotans. The second item I wish to focus on are the high drug costs. We all know that unrestrained pharmaceutical costs represent an ever-increasing part of the health care bill. As we continue to address this overcomplicated aspect of our health care system, please support the pre-deductible flat copay legislation within this omnibus bill. While it does not solve the high costs of pharmaceuticals, it does create a path to affordability for Minnesotans struggling to afford their care from life-threatening chronic conditions. We heard testimony in committee from patients face a cliff of costs at the start of each plan year. High deductibles, monthly premiums, high copays on prescription drugs, all at once to get the life-saving medications that they need. This bill gives them an opportunity to continue their critical treatments without interruption. It would require health insurance companies to sell new health plans that use copays for all prescriptions starting day one and spread those costs over the full 12-month plan. 
These new plans would smooth out chronically ill patients' monthly payments without passing on costs to neighbors who don't want or need this benefit option. It is not a mandate for consumers. The marginal cost increase is borne by those who buy it. Insurance companies come out whole each year. And the best part is this plan works. It has already worked well for years in Colorado and Montana. Actuarial figures demonstrate this plan's success in those states. The plan has now been adopted in eight states. It is a modest but important proposal designed simply to provide the opportunity for patients to manage the high cost of their drugs so they can focus on fighting their affliction. Patient organizations have lined up in support. Members, we need to line up and support patients in our districts too. Let's bring relief to thousands of Minnesotans who are just trying to afford their lives. Please support this omnibus bill. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Pryor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wanna continue the introduction of this bill. This is a bill that everyone will want to vote for because each one of us has constituents who have pleaded with us to do something about access to prescription drugs. This access is keeping people up at night. This access is the subject of conversations around the kitchen table with stacks of bills and exhausted faces. What's hurting is that no matter what the cost, some of these drugs are essential to our quality of life and in some cases, life itself. Our constituents have told us loud and clear, the system has to change. This bill makes change. It's a problem solving bill, helping Minnesotans get the prescription drugs they need at prices they can afford. It does it by prohibiting price drug price gouging. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. It does it by getting PBMs out of our public health care programs. It does it by raising reimbursement rates for pharmacists to help independents stay in business. It does it by prohibiting insurance plans from making mid-year formulary changes. Thank you, Representative Elkins. It does it by removing the PBM gag rule. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Now, we know that change is complicated and not universally popular but we need to show up for the people of Minnesota and be their voice and their vote for solving the problem, not just sticking with the status quo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I just want to thank my LA and CLA, Lindsay Hansen, who keeps things running. I wanna thank my committee administrator, Ying Ya Wang, who had the courage to face the challenges of human services as a new CA and did a fabulous work. I wanna thank Patrick McQuillan, Chris McCall, Joe Durheim, and all our nonpartisan staff who went above and beyond expectations and worked overtime to staff our committees and help us construct this excellent bill. I also wanna thank all of the Human Services Committee members, in particular, Vice Chair Bonner and Lead Representative Albright. Members showed up every day to work on legislation that has culminated in this bill. I, want, I also wanna add my thanks to the commissioners, to DHS staff. I'm continuously impressed by their work ethic and dedication to improving our state. Lastly, I wanna thank Chair Liebling. She has been a phenomenal mentor. She's intelligent, tenacious, and tireless. And I couldn't ask for a better colleague to learn from and work with. Frankly, this is the best HHS bill I can recall. I wanna thank Chair Moran and Speaker Hortman for giving us a healthy budget target. The pandemic highlighted the challenges faced by many Minnesotans. This bill not only addresses some of those challenges, it strengthens our state. This bill reflects our compassion and our values. It lifts up and supports families. It is very essential that we invest in our infrastructure and not only roads and bridges, but our people. The definition of infrastructure is that which consists of the basic facilities which enable a country or society to function. 
facilities that are essential for everyone to live. To sustain the people in our state, we need to invest in shelter, food, clean water, health care, and programs to help people survive. We need to invest in our children and our elders, those with disabilities, our essential workers, and our caregivers. The Human Services Bill makes these investments in preventing homelessness with funding for emergency shelters, addressing poverty by improving economic assistance through UMFIP, improving access to food by expanding SNAP, increasing wages to PCAs, improving and building a more diverse mental health workforce, reforming the infrastructure for treating substance abuse, protecting children from maltreatment, and investing in families to reduce out-of-home placements, and investing in care workers. Equity is addressed throughout all of these investments. All of us care about the well-being of others, and most people seek to do good things. This bill does many good things for people across the state. Please support it. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Gomez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, homelessness is the manifestation of the failure of so many of our systems of care. It's the result and source of compounding trauma and pain in the lives of human beings who are precious and valued and loved members of our communities. Homelessness exists at this intersection of housing availability and affordability, wage stagnation and economic inequality, deep and persistent racial disparities, trauma, substance use disorder, and mental illness. I, I'm proud to lead the Preventing Homelessness Committee. We're a small committee, but we have, as you can see, a, a vast and complicated uh, policy area to address. Um, homelessness particularly impacts some of the most vulnerable members of society. Children, people with disabilities, veterans and elders are most likely to experience homelessness. And this is not a metro issue. It impacts every community in our state and our investments meet that geographic reality and challenge. Uh, homelessness is complicated and the response to the issue is complicated. We have to simultaneously address the immediate deepening human tragedy, especially of unsheltered homelessness, while we also make sure that there are adequate options across the entire continuum of housing so that once folks are stabilized, they actually have a solid place to land and make a home for themselves and their families. This work is not simple, but we all bear the cost when we get it wrong, so it's worth doing right. Across this budget and the omnibus bills that we've already voted on over the last week and a half, you'll see a comprehensive approach to preventing and ending homelessness. We can always do more, but we do a whole lot in this budget. This house position is reflected in major investments across the entire continuum of housing, in the bonding and housing bills, investments in the tax bill that put us on, an, on a path to ending child homelessness in Minnesota, the state gov and veterans bill will help us get those last 150 vets who are experiencing homelessness in Minnesota indoors for good. The Public safety bill helps us address the role that housing stability plays in helping those coming out of incarceration to be restored to their place in their home communities. Even the commerce bill contains an important provision authored by Representative Agbaje that reforms self storage laws, which is a service that people experiencing homelessness often have to access. And House File 2128, the HHS omnibus bill in front of us today, invests significantly in expanding shelter capacity, which is Representative Hassan's bill, funds Representative Cagle's bill, which provides wraparound supportive services, and Representative Howard's provision that provides grants to flexibly support direct service providers with funding for shelter, community outreach, and culturally specific programming as they have completely reorganized their work due to COVID among many other policy or measures that are included in this bill. I'm so thankful to Chair Schultz and the members and staff on the Human Services Committee for the priority that this bill places on helping those in our community who are struggling the most, including those experiencing homelessness. 
I want to express my sincere gratitude to all the members who are part of the division and the staff who support our work so ably, especially to Vice Chair Keeler and Lee New Brindley and all the members of the committee. We passed a lot of bipartisan bills and I'm grateful for the compassion and commitment that you all show up with every single day in this work. Um, we're supported by amazing partisan and nonpartisan staff, including House researchers Danielle Punelli and Randall Chun, fiscal analyst Ken Savory, DFL research Molly Peterson, GOP research Bill Guan, and our committee administrator, who keeps us all on track, uh, Sean Herring, and our CLA, Kevin Petrie. I'm, I'm really thankful to all of them. The group of direct service providers that advocates for those in our communities who are experiencing homelessness have a saying. Housing ends homelessness and shelter saves lives. This bill taken along with the rest of our omnibus bills makes the needed investment in both housing and shelter. And I urge your support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to start by thanking Speaker Hartman for creating a committee to tackle the important growing issues of behavioral health needs here in the state of Minnesota. I'd like to thank the staff that was staffing our committee, Chris McCall, our committee administrator, Spencer Kroos, our legislative assistants, Dave Sullivan and Harry Kennedy, our DFL and Republican researchers. I'd also like to uh, thank Sarah Sutterman, our nonpartisan house researcher. I want to thank the committee members for the hard work that we did on our committee. Specifically, I'd like to also thank Vice Chair Frederick and our lead representative, Frankie. We did very good bipartisan work in our committee, and I'm proud to say that every bill we had had a unanimous vote. But it wasn't easy. This reflects the hard work and discussions that were done on committee on a weekly basis. We repeatedly were heard that Minnesota's behavioral health system is not broken. That is because it never existed. And so we took a comprehensive approach to addressing and improving access to services and making it easier for providers to deliver care. Some of the provisions that we have that came through our committee that are in this bill, are very, some of them are very large. One of them is the uniform service standards. We have 900, and the, the bill we have before us, House File uh, 2128, is over 970 pages long. Out of that, about 250 pages comes from the work that we did on the uniform service standards in mental health. I'd like to thank my co-author, co Representative Frankie, for the help and work on this. This bill eliminated duplicate and conflicting license requirements across all types of mental health professionals, consolidated all statutes into streamlined chapter of law, and reflects the work, consensus work of providers in DHS over several years. Some of the other things that we heard clearly on is we heard that we had workforce issues. In the bill, we increased diversity in our behavioral health workforce and availability of culturally specific treatment. We also heard about the shortage of mental health beds out there and behavioral health beds. So we had provisions in this bill here that incentivize more behavioral health beds in our hospital systems with changes to the state's bed moratorium and to increase the reimbursement rates. And finally, a lot of work was done on enrolling substance use disorder treatment facilities into the 1115 Federal Demonstration Project. This is a project that raises standards of care and frees up state dollars to reinvest in higher rates and more resources for our providers. Once again, I'd also like to thank Representative Frankie for his help and assistance as we worked on this part of the bill. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to present. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. The COVID-19 economic crisis has led to dramatic increases in joblessness and hardships. It's important that we support programs that can improve better outcomes for working families and children's academic, health, and economic outcomes at the time of need. It's crucial that all families with children have income to cover their basic needs, not only in the current public health and economic crisis, but also for their children's future. Many families and children are facing deep and persistent poverty. These programs exist to help Minnesotans in the moments they cannot plan for, the times they face crisis that changes their lives and sense of security as individuals, and the times that the global pandemic alters our daily lives. 
as a society. These programs are needed for many Minnesotans in the best times, and they are critical in the worst. This bill includes a one-time MFIP payment, Minnesota Family Investment Program, of up to $750 using TANF funds, impacting about 32,400 families, including over 64,000 children. Members, this bill will help address financial hardships expressed by families and children during the pandemic and also assist the working families to get back to work. This bill establishes an annual cost of living adjustment for MFIP families based on the Consumer Price Index CPI. The current MFIP cash benefits of 632 for a family of three falls below the definition of deep poverty. This is an important step for us to address financial hardship ex experienced by many families and especially children. Since the pandemic began in early March, the Department of Human Services the counties, the tribal government have taken many steps to ensure that Minnesotans who need help and who qualify for programs are able to access them as quickly as possible, including lifting the face-to-face -face interviews. This bill streamlines applications and eligibility determination process for benefits and supports reducing paperwork burdens for the participants. It also establishes a consistent processing system by using prospective budgeting for MFIP and general assistance. Finally, this bill raises the income limit from 165% federal poverty guidelines to the maximum allowable 200% federal poverty guidelines, increasing eligibility of Minnesotans for the SNAP program based on categorical eligibility for children, seniors, and people with disabilities. Members, we need to lift up everyone at the time of need to address food insecurity, economic insecurity, and housing insecurity. This bill is a labor of love to address the needs we face. It's a time that we have to step up and do the right thing. Thank you so much, members. The representative from Rice, Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Minnesota to be a state that works for everyone, we have to ensure that people with disabilities and older adults can access the care they need. This is a matter of human dignity and sometimes a matter of life and death. When it comes to personal care assistance in Minnesota, there was a crisis in the PCA workforce before COVID and now it's even more severe. There are 44,000 Minnesotans with disabilities and older adults who access PCA services. 55,000 Minnesotans work as PCAs. Of these care providers, 82% are women and 62% are people of color. According to a 2020 legislative report, the average PCA makes just $12.38 an hour, and this results in high turnover in the workforce. To address this workforce crisis, we need to pay direct care providers fairly for this life-sustaining and often life-saving care they provide. The HHS bill addresses the needs faced by people with disabilities and older adults who depend on PCA services and the needs of PCAs themselves through four important provisions. First, the bill has $68 million to fund and ratify a contract for almost 29,000 self-directed home care workers represented by SEIU, most of whom are women and people of color, and the rate increase will cover private sector PCAs not represented by the union as well. At the heart of this contract is a minimum wage that will go up from 1325 to 1525 an hour by July 1st, 2022. I want to thank Representative Frederick for his work on this provision. Second, the bill establishes a cost-based data-driven rate framework for PCA services that develops a competitive workforce factor, making sure that PCA wages are keeping up with similarly situated workers in the private economy. The rate framework will make sure that PCAs are paid fairly in the years ahead. Third, Late in 2020, the legislature temporarily allowed parents and spouses to be reimbursed for providing PCA services. That provision expired on February 7th. Thanks to Representative Patty Acom, this bill revives this extremely helpful provision and extends it to the expiration of the federal COVID-19 public health emergency. And finally, Minnesota started Waiver Reimagine to make the home and community-based waiver system simpler, easier to understand, and more person-centered. Authorized in 2019, phase one 
of waiver reimagine features a simplified service menu across all four waivers. And this bill implements, implements phase two of waiver reimagine that combines the four disability waivers into two. These provisions are important for the dignity, health and safety of people with disabilities. And since a, such a high percentage of PCAs are women and people of color, these are key equity provisions in the bill too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I'd like to thank Chairs Schultz and Liebling and all of the members and staff who put so much heart and compassion into this committee's work. I stepped into this work because I believe that politics is how we care about and for each other. And this year's Health and Human Services Bill is a direct reflection of this value, and I'm honored to have had the opportunity to serve on this committee this year. Since I'm new here, I did my homework. I listened to the past HHS omnibus presentations, and I came to the conclusion that this body has long valued protecting and supporting children, uplifting and empowering families of all kinds, and providing quality services to Minnesotans. This year, this bill is an important and renewed commitment to intentionally address long-standing issues that face some Minnesotans more than others. Be it because of racism, age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, religion, or income discrimination, this bill says loud and clear that everyone has inherent dignity and worth, and that electeds in this body in Minnesota are here to serve our friends and neighbors that sent us here to do good, caring work. This bill acknowledges the intersectional isms that exist in Minnesota and says that we have the courage, wherewithal, and resources to address it. This bill tangibly begins to reassemble the systems that are not working equitably across racial, income, religious, age, disability, geographic, and gender lines. This bill supports Minnesotans' right to pursue happiness and to thrive in our great state with the support of our phenomenal health and human services departments. I rose today to specifically speak to a few provisions of this bill that will prioritize helping families stay together with the supports that these families need. Navigating the barriers of this, these systems is extremely hard and overwhelming. And we know that there are vast disparities in outcomes for BIPOC families compared to white families. First, Representative Knorr's hard work ensures that this bill provides the investments necessary to ensure we're in federal compliance with the Fa Federal Family First Prevention and Services Act. It provides funding to bring on additional staff and to develop and deploy prevention programs designed to help keep families together. Additionally, this bill addresses a complex issue addressed in my uh, House File 944 in collaboration with our county and child mental health advocates. It provides a new path for low in families with low incomes to receive intense behavioral health care for their children without forcing them to go through the child welfare systems to do so. Even though these families pose no safety risk to their children, nearly 700 families a year go through this process to get these services covered by federal $40. After many years of work and collaboration, this provision finally corrects this and replaces the funding to ensure our counties are made whole. This will also make sure that there are more resources available to address families and kids' needs who need some support to ensure everybody is safe at home. Lastly, this bill includes grant money for the Minnesota One Stop for Communities, championed by Rep. Becker Finn. They provide critical support to parents, caregivers, and families that are going through the child welfare channels. These intervention methods can make the difference between reunification and generational trauma. Families going through this process need mentorship, guidance, support, and encouragement, and coaching. And these grants will help more families be together again. Less than two decades ago, I was a teen mom who could never have seen myself standing before you today. I relied on social safety nets, many of which are supported in this bill, to get where I am today. And I could talk for a very long time about the importance of all the great things in this bill and how important the services are to Minnesotans who are just trying to make ends meet and provide for their families. Instead, I'll leave you with this. Investing in family values looks like supporting this bill. 
Investing in people who need a hand and our care looks like supporting this bill. Investing in the services Minnesotans need to thrive looks like supporting this bill. And investing in the safety nets, systemic reform, and in Minnesotans who need us most right now looks like supporting this bill. Thank you, members. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the chairs, committee members, and staff for all your hard work on creating this bill. I'm excited to highlight the provisions of this bill with a strong equity focus and build a more representative and diverse workforce from geography to cultural backgrounds. For many years, Minnesota and much of the country have experienced a long-standing workforce shortage for providers of behavioral health and mental health services. With increased needs due to the pandemic, these provisions are more urgent than ever. The bill contains numerous provisions that are designed to address this shortage in the mental health workforce and the lack of diversity among providers. Main provisions include making alcohol and drug counselors eligible for an existing loan forgiveness program, expanding who can be a mental health practitioner by including a student who has completed an internship, allowing children's mental health grants to be used to provide supervision to clinical trainees from BIPOC communities, strengthening continuing education requirements, requiring private, requiring private health insurance to cover treatment provided by clinical trainees, establishing a culturally informed and responsive mental health and alternative pathways task force, creating a work group to discuss um, alternative licensure and increasing diversity on licensing boards. I'm happy to see continued investments in the Indian Child Welf Welfare Act and Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act on training and development for county child welf welfare and child protection staff. This is a critical provision to combat past wrongs and prevent further harm to our native children. We all know that there are deep disp health disparities and now exacerbated due to the pandemic when it comes to our black indigenous and people of color communities. I'm happy to support these provisions to tackle our health inequities and improve mental health and well-being for all people, no matter where they live and what they look like. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Waswick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, one of the things, uh, several members have talked about silver linings of this pandemic. And one of the things that has been revealed to many of us who maybe didn't know this before was the importance of our child care providers across the state. They stepped up to take care of the kids of our essential workers um, throughout the pandemic. And many of them have been struggling with increased costs due to reduced attendance um, and the need to follow COVID-19 health and safety protocols. Um, in 2019, the legislature um, put forth legislation to establish the Family Child Care Task Force. I was the co-chair of this task force along with Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, and we worked with a group of about 25 um, folks to come up with a set of recommendations to help family child care providers um, get into the field and stay in the field. Um, several of these provisions are in uh, the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We have provisions to, regu uh, to modernize regulations for both family and center providers, uh, more assistance for providers in the form of training, a shared services pilot program, um, Representative Damas a provision to um, establish an ombudsperson, and a mentoring program. There are also incentives for early care and learning professionals to stay in the field. Um, it's a field with very low pay and high turnover, and so we uh, try to help providers stay in the field by um, having a TEACH grant program to help them uh, obtain credentials and stay in the field. There's also a provision in the bill to expand options for inclusive child care for children with disabilities. Um, I've heard from lots of parents who have kids with disabilities who have trouble finding providers that can meet the needs. So this is some funding to help counties um, work with providers to find ways to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all children in our child care facilities. Um, I'd appreciate your support of these provisions, which will help providers and the children and families that they serve. Thank you. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Mr. Speaker, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and, and can you hear me now? Is that still working? We can still hear you. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, members, I'm the last person to, uh, to present on the bill and, and our HHS team members is ending our presentation of this bill back at the beginning, namely with a focus on the earliest years for young kids and their families. As chair of the Early Childhood Committee, I'm proud that the bill contains much work from our committee, but more importantly, members, 
I'm proud that the whole bill throughout it prioritizes getting every child off to a great start. You've heard that prioritization throughout the preceding presentation. Um, and members, let's recall that early development care and learning is in multiple directions. It's uh, unaffordable and even inaccessible for families, pays poverty wages to teachers and caregivers, and allows for widening opportunity gaps at the time when we know that they can be prevented. Our Select Committee on Racial Justice has called on us to invest in this area as a matter of equity, and this bill, in conjunction with the early childhood provisions and the education budget bill, does so. So members, drawing on bills from Representatives Bolden and Pryor, we boost child care support for low-income families to the 50th percentile of market rates, much closer to the federal standard, and reprioritize waiting lists to get more learning and care to vulnerable kids. Many of these children receive their early learning and care from families, friends, or neighbors, and drawing on a bill from Representative Howard, we provide increased support for those providers. And drawing on bills from Representatives Waslowick and Katiza Watoon, we increase support for child care for children with disabilities and those in foster care. We also stabilize and expand the supply of early learning and care in a variety of ways, but most excitingly by continuing the monthly grants that have gone to this sector during the pandemic and requiring that most of this funding go straight to individual teachers and caregivers who, members remember, currently make so little that a quarter of them are worried about feeding their own families. And finally, in this bill, members, we include considerable reform and evaluation for this critical sector, including an evaluation of Parent Aware, our state's quality metric for care and learning. I am grateful to the author of that proposal, Representative Cryer, for her rock-solid help and counsel as my vice chair. I'm grateful to Representative Franson for her partnership as minority lead and to all the members of the Early Childhood Committee, and especially Representative Wozniak for leading that task force she described, and to our amazing staff and my first-time committee administrator, Polly Sirk-Venick, first-time committee legislative assistant, Shanika Chambers, our partisan researchers, Mars beltrani Rudquist and Jody Withers, both of whom members I want to point out pulled double duty, being full-time in education and handling our committee's HHS provisions, and finally, especially to our House research staff, Annie Mock, Emily uh, Adrians and Doug Berg, each of whom has been just incredible. Members, this bill is the product of a lot of thought, work, and careful decisions. There are a number of uh, HHS topics not addressed in it, but what is in the bill reflects a deep focus on helping every single Minnesotan to thrive. Our team is so proud of this bill, and we look forward to reviewing amendments together now and to a constructive discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, point of order. Yes, please state your point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is Representative Garofalo. I rise to a point of order under Article 1, Section 5 of the uh, Minnesota State Constitution. Uh, the introduction of this bill clearly violates uh, the constitutional prohibition on unusual punishments, and I would ask that you uh, take the point of order as well taken. There are amendments at the desk. <laughs> The clerk will report the amendment. Mr. Speaker, I withdraw my point of order. Thank you. <laughs> well, Liebling moves to amend House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment. The amendment is coded A101. I recognize the author, I recognize the, author of the amendment, uh, Representative Liebling, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, well, that's a tough one to follow that point of order. We'll have to file that away for the future, Representative Garofalo. Um, members, I uh, am offering the A101 author's amendment. Whenever we have an omnibus bill, um, there are always last minute changes, uh, a lot of technical things, but there are, there are a number of things in this and I'm just gonna run through them very quickly so that members know what they're voting on. Um, not everything, just uh, kind of the, the highlights. There are some addition of some effective dates that uh, go into the bed, hospital bed moratorium section of the bill. Um, we are deleting a section that dealt with um, contraceptive benefits in, in health insurance plans. Um, we have um, some, a bill here from Representative Rasmussen on crisis stabilization services that is being added to the bill. We are um, deleting some language, uh, you heard members speak about it, um, having to do with personal care attendance. We're deleting some language and replacing it with Senate language on the same topic that we thought was, uh, um, in, in this rare case, better language what, than what the House had. Um, and there is a, a section here from Representative Pinto 
that has direction to the Children's Cabinet um, to have an evaluation of the use of federal money. And, um, and then finally, we just have some, some language regarding federal funds for vaccine activities, and that's just technical language um, correcting what we previously had in the bill. So with that, members, I would ask for your support of the A101 amendment. Mr. Speaker. Yes, any discussion to the A101 amendment? Mr. Speaker, Albright. point of order. Uh, please state your point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker, under Rule 3.21, motions and propositions. And I'm prepared to give advice. Yes, please state your advice. Mr. Speaker and members, uh, just remind you of what Rule 3.21 says. A motions and or proposition on a subject different than that under consideration must not be admitted under guise of it being an amendment. A motion amendment or other proposition offered to the House is out of order if it is not germane to the matter under consideration. Members, the uh, A101 introduces new topics into the bill. It changes to opioid, there are changes to opioid manufacturing settlements and evaluation of federal funds related to early childhood is invoked. So with that, I would urge, uh, urge you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to find in favor of my point of order. Further advice? Mr. Speaker. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, Mr. Speaker, I don't see that there is anything here that isn't already in this in this omnibus bill. Um, so I think that the things, the points that were raised, and I'm sorry, I don't know who was speaking there, but um, uh, I am the the um, the issue about federal funds is just a clear is just clarification language to what is already here and in addition i'm not the author of the provision but the opioid the change to the opioid um, account is just clarification language to what is already in the bill so um, i really don't see how this would be out of order I have studied the amendment. I have studied the amendment and have taken advice from representatives Albright and Liebling, and I find the point of order not well taken. Mr. Speaker. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would move to divide the amendment. Yes, please state would you like the division to be? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would divide the amendment between lines 1.15 and 1.16, and between 1.18 and 1.19, and I would request a vote on the divided language first.
Representative Albright, it does appear to be uh, divisible, and you would like to proceed first with sections 1.16 through 1.18. That is my motion, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I would request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Members, we are voting on the Liebling Amendment, the A101, sections 1.16 through sections 1.18. Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry, lines 1.16 through line 1.18. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for that. And members, I would urge a green vote on this division and for the vote on this part of that amendment. Thank you. Further Mr. discussion? Mr. Speaker. Representative, Representative Liebling. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, Mr. Speaker, point of parliamentary inquiry. Yes, state your point of parliamentary inquiry. So, well, Mr. Speaker, is it permissible to divide an amendment in two places? Representative Liebling, I believe we have uh, lines 1.16 through uh, lines 1.18 that we're taking up now, and then the rest of the amendment will be next. Okay, um, so uh, Mr. Speaker, um, thank you. So members, just so that you know what you're voting on here. So um, we um, were gonna take out the contraceptive uh, provisions. These are Representative Morrison's provisions. She may wish to speak to it. But, um, it, you know, really there's nothing wrong with them. So um, this is something that I would um, tell members if you, uh, what these provisions do, members, is put into Minnesota law provisions of the Affordable Care Act that require contraceptive coverage under health plans. And um, it's very carefully crafted. It, it um, just puts into law what we have right now, including provisions that allow closely held companies to be exempted and so on. So all the religious liberty objections to it are really taken care of in the bill. So um, if you uh, would like to, if you prefer that these not be in the bill, then um, I guess you would vote on, um, since, let's see, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, maybe I need a little help here, just if you could, before we vote, explain the effect of voting yes or voting no so that members are very clear on this. But these provisions in our amendment are taking out Representative Morrison's bill. So um, you may wish to vote no, and then I think that would keep this in the bill, which would remove her provision. If you wanted to keep her provision in the bill, um, then I think I think you would vote um, yes to remove this. I'm, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm probably confusing the issue, so I hope that you and the desk can explain what is happening when people vote yes or no on this section. Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, members, so the amendment as divided, we are taking up these three uh, provisions, lines 1.6, 1.7, and 1.8. Representative Winkler, uh, it's lines 1.16. 1 1.6. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lines 1.16, 1 1.17, and 1.18, deleting sections 15, 16, and 20 from the bill. This is the amendment offered by Representative Liebling and the amendment offered by Representative Liebling would remove these sections related to contraception from the bill. Representative Albright moved to divide the amendment. The amendment is divided. We are voting on this part of the Liebling amendment first, and I would urge members to vote green on this amendment. Further discussion? The clerk will take the roll.
Members, please vote. The clerk will call the names of those members who have not voted yet. <clears throat> Bolden. Bolden, yes. Bolden I, Christensen. Christensen. Christensen, I. Christensen, I. Daphne. Daphne, I. Daphne, I. Detmer. Detmer, I. Detmer, I. Green. Green, I. Green, I. Grossel. Grossel, I. Grossel, I. Hanson, R. Hanson, R. I. Hanson, R. I. Houseman. Houseman, I. Houseman, I. Hurtos. Hurtas. Hurtas, I. Hurtas, I. Kosnick. I. Kosnick, I. Markwart. Markwart, I. Markwart, I. Mason. Mason. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Moran. Moran, I. Moran, I. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Novotny. Novotny, I. Pinto. Pinto, I. Pinto, I. Sandell. Sandell. Sandell, I. Sandell, I. Sundin. Sundin, I. Sundin, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Sosinski I. Thompson. Thompson I. Thompson I. Zhang J. I. Zhang J. I. Mason I. Mason I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 132 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Members, we're on the second portion of the amendment. Members, we are on the second portion of the A101 amendment. Discussion. Repres uh, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Included in the A101 amendment is a new rate setting structure for small crisis stabilization units. These are four bed facilities that provide short term residential mental health services for Minnesotans experiencing a mental health crisis. This new rate setting structure will help ensure the survival of our remaining small crisis stabilization units and will improve the access to mental health care, especially in greater Minnesota. In addition, crisis stabilization units also save the state money. The alternative for most crisis stabilization patients is hospitalization, so sending them to a crisis stabilization bed saves the state money. I thank Chair Schultz for giving the original bill a hearing, and also thank Chair Liebling for including it in her author's amendment today. I also want to thank my fellow bill authors for their advocacy, Representatives Jessica Hansen, Representative Keeler, uh, Franson, Eklund, Igo, Lisslegard, Marcourt, and Sandstead. This provision is a great example of bipartisan problem solving. As I started working on this issue, I received a letter from a constituent named Laura. Laura's story begins as a stay-at-home mom who found herself facing severe treatment-resistant depression. She said in her letter to me, as excruciating and painful as it was to leave my home and my family, I knew I needed a safe environment to go which could support my healing. 
The Crisis Stabilization Unit was there in one of my desperate times. They provided a healing space. I was able to stay in my community and stay close to my family. Crisis Stabilization provided me a safe and supportive environment which perpetuated my healing. Uh, today, members, I am happy to say that Laura is not only doing much better, but she actually went on to become a certified peer support specialist and currently works at the same crisis stabilization unit in Fergus Falls that treated her as a patient, helping others on their path to healing and recovery. I again thank Chair Schultz and Chair Liebling for including this in the omnibus today. We're going to have more stories like Laura's given this provision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Wabasha, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam. Mr. Speaker, I rise a point of parliamentary inquiry. Please state your point of parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that you uh, let the body know at every step of the way as we're working through this rather complicated uh, situation here, what it is we're voting on. Uh, so if you could clearly articulate and re-articulate that it would be helpful to us as members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, we are currently on the A101 amendment, the second portion, which is all of the amendment except for lines 1.16 through lines 1.18. Those lines of the amendment were previously voted on. So we're on the remainder of the A101 amendment. Further discussion to the second portion of the A101 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Mr. Speaker. Yes, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I actually rise for a point of parliamentary inquiry. Yes, um, please state your point of parliamentary inquiry. We got a new fiscal note this morning that shows that this bill is out of balance. So my question is, what is what would be the appropriate course of action right now? I can raise a point of order on the bill. I can uh, make a motion to move the bill back to the Ways and, Midi Ways and Means Committee to resolve uh, the, the budget being out of balance. What, what would be the appropriate action right now? Uh, representative, it's up to you what what motion you'd like to make. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Then I guess I would make a motion to move the bill back to Ways and Means Committee. And I would roll call that, please. I'd request a roll call. Okay, first let's take the roll call. Seeing a roll call has been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative New Brindley moves that House File 2128 be re referred to Ways and Means? To Ways and Means. Correct. Roll call having been requested. Any further discussion? Mr. Speaker. Oh, uh, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, I, I just want to point out, you know, we've had many discussions about uh, Rule 4.03 throughout the debate over our omnibus bills. But I want to be very clear. I want to read it again. It says, after the adoption of a resolution by the Committee on Ways and Means, an amendment to a bill is out of order if it would cause any of the limits specified in the resolution to be exceeded. Um, and right now, this bill is out of balance with that budget resolution. Uh, the, the total general fund increase, the target, is 256 uh, million, approximately. But we got a fiscal note just this morning. First of all, we got, we got a, an updated spreadsheet from House fiscal staff um, indicating 
that House File 910 that is included in the bill, that House File 910 has a cost of $50,000. That's what's in the spreadsheet that came from House Fiscal Staff this morning. However, this morning at just before 11 o'clock, we, re we received a revised fiscal note um, on House File 910 with a cost of almost $200,000. And this, so this puts the budget resolution, this puts the bill out of balance with the budget resolution by about $150,000, Mr. Speaker. So I would, uh, I would encourage members to vote yes to send this bill back to Ways and Means so that we can get this issue resolved before sending the bill to the Senate. Further discussion on the New Brindley motion to re-refer the bill to Ways and Means. Further discussion? Representative Winkler. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative New Brindley, I wonder if you would yield to a question. Yes. Represent she will yield. Representative New Brindley, could you please describe for us what House File 910 is, what the original fiscal note stated, how, whether House File 910 is exactly worded the same in the underlying bill as it is in this bill, and how the fiscal note changed, please. Uh, Representative New Brindley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, House File 910 requires a, re a report that is, that is currently not paid for in the bill um, according to the fiscal note that has been updated. This just came out this morning. Um, it is, it's very clear the, in, the, in the spreadsheet from House Fiscal Staff, it, it accounts for $50,000. The actual bill cost that came out again at just, it came out at 10.53 this morning, um, has, has a cost of almost $200,000. It's out of balance, there's just no question about that. Uh, the bill just needs to go back to Ways and Means. I'm assuming that it could get cleaned up pretty quickly in, in Ways and Means, but that does need to be taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I urge a no vote on the new Brindley motion. Uh, I have not heard that the language included in this uh, bill to date is precisely the same as was included in the original House File 910 or how the fiscal note impacts this. So members, at this point in time, uh, absent uh, information, uh, there is no reason to think that the bill is out of balance, and I would ask for a no vote. The representative from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as I was listening to this, it looks sounds like the delta is $150,000. I'm hearkening back to approximately a week and a half ago when we were on this very floor debating the state gov, state gov finance bill with a discrepancy of $3,000. And so if one were to, uh, to compare $3,000 to $150,000, obviously it is many, many, many times larger, the discrepancy now. And therefore, since this body uh, ruled that we were not able to add an amendment, I believe it was, because of an additional delta of $3,000, we absolutely must, must, for the sake of integrity, intellectual honesty, not uh, uh, adhere to the Winkler advice to vote red, we must vote green. We must stand for truth, members. Please vote green. Thank you. The representative from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Liebling yield for a question? Representative Liebling? Yes. Yes, she will yield. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Rep Mr. Speaker, Representative Liebling, um, has the, has the uh, fiscal note in question been shared with you? Mr. Speaker, um, Representative Garofalo, um, I just saw that, Representative Garofalo, just now. I think it had just come this morning in our email. Um, and this is a portion, a portion of the bill that is Representative Pinto's part of the bill. So as you know, this is three different omnibus bills joined together, three committee bills joined together. So um, this is um, 
a provision that I'm not all that familiar with. So I think it would probably be Representative Pinto who would speak to this. Okay, thank, thank you, um, Representative Liebling. Mr. Speaker, would uh, Representative Pinto please yield to her question? Representative Pinto? I will yield, Mr. Speaker. He I will yield. yield, Mr. Speaker. He will yield. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Speaker and Representative Pinto, just two questions. Number one, have you had time to review the fiscal note? I know this is a long nature. If, um, have you had an opportunity to review that fiscal note? And number two, do you believe that it is accurate? Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Garofalo, um, I've had a, a bit of a chance to review it. Um, I actually don't believe that it, uh, that it uh, uh, fully reflects costs for the, for the department, uh, and I feel very confident uh, that we can, uh, we'll be able to address that uh, as, uh, as things move forward. And Mr. Speaker, Representative Pinto, Garofalo. You, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Pinto. Um, can you just explain to members of the committee why you or members of the House uh, why you believe that? Obviously, fiscal notes are advisory in nature, but it would be highly unusual for us just to um, disregard them in the construct of, a, of a, an amendment. Can you just give us some guidance on why it is that you feel you're right in the Legislative Budget Office is wrong? Are you asking Representative Pinto to yield? I am, Mr. Speaker. Thank Representative you. Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank you, Representative Garofalo, and I appreciate the reminder about the advisory nature of, of, of fiscal notes. Um, and I'll, I'll note that uh, I think a big part of this is that uh, the focus, so, so to confirm the, the content of this, as long as you're asking about it, is um, to make sure that our child care system is responding to the needs of children in foster care, and in particular to have a plan to, um, to address that. Uh, as I review the fiscal note, I'm concerned that there's a uh, misunderstanding that there's a uh, uh, that what the legislature is, is looking for is a is a very large report and ongoing uh, an ongoing approach to this rather than what we really had uh, in mind and intended uh, and, and the bill's author of Zinkatiza Batoon um, was a uh, was a, um, a simple report and plan to say let's identify what's going on with children in foster care and uh, and give uh, some guidance and thoughts as to what we should do going forward so we do have an appropriation in the bill to reflect that. Um, but it's not the size of this fiscal note because, as I say, I believe there's a, um, uh, that that is not what we, uh, what we intend. Um, but as you say, you pointed out that fiscal notes are advisory, and uh, so uh, we appreciate that guidance and those thoughts. Um, and uh, I feel quite confident that we can address this in the, in the context of this, uh, of this bill. And Mr. Speaker, if Representative, Representative Pinto, Garofalo. Would, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pinto, would you yield for another question? I, I will, Mr. Speaker, I will yield. He, he will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. And Mr. Mr. Speaker and Representative Pinto, so if I understand the answer to my question, you are saying that this report is not as extensive as the Legislative Budget Office has assumed. Is that the answer to your question? If I'm mistaken, please uh, uh, restate it in the words that are more accurate of your opinion. Representative Pinto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Garofalo. Representative Garofalo, I, I do want to be careful here because, as you, um, as you yourself uh, noted, uh, this is, uh, uh, things are moving uh, fairly fluidly here and fairly quickly, um, but I think that at least in, in part, in significant part, um, that would be a concern um, that I would have. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but again, I'm, I, I feel confident that we're um, uh, maybe simply that, uh, understanding that. So, yeah, thanks. Mr. Speaker, if Representative Pinto would yield for, if Representative Pinto would yield for one more question. Representative Pinto, will you yield? I will. He will yield. Thank Representative you. Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Pinto. Outside the uh, mis the um, the difference of opinion about the level of depth of the fiscal of the uh, report, is there any other discrepancies or um, uh, contentions you would take up with the fiscal note? Any disputes that you have with it? Representative Pinto. Uh Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Um, well, this is where, as I say, it's a little bit challenging because I've been um, um, uh, make, making my way through it um, in the course of uh, uh, some other things occupying me this morning. So I, I, I believe that there may be um, uh, something else, Representative Garofalo, but I'll admit that I'm, I'm scrambling a little bit um, on it. I, I guess I will note, um, uh, I believe that, uh, that 403 uh, applies to amendments offered um, uh, on the floor, and, and obviously we need to take all of this into, into account. Um, but, uh, uh, but as I say, I, I, I know that that is a substantial part of, it, the, of the report. I'm reluctant to, to, uh, to identify other things that I say it's, it's moving quickly, um, but, uh, uh, but I think that that's a substantial part of it.
Okay. Well, Representative Mr. Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Representative Pinto, and Representative Liebling. I appreciate you guys, um, uh, your answers that you supplied us with. Uh, obviously, when you're presenting an omnibus bill on the floor and you receive a fiscal note the day that the bill is up on the floor, um, that is less than ideal, and I sympathize with the situation you're put in. Uh, Majority Leader Winkler, if I may offer a actually friendly suggestion, uh, it may be wise to recess um, to the call of the chair for 10 or 15 minutes so you guys can get this stuff straightened out. Um, I don't think, I mean, obviously, if the uh, majority leader is getting up and saying he doesn't want this bill sent back to the committee to be fixed, uh, if that motion were to fail, then we're going to get a point of order on, budget, on the budget resolution. And we really don't want the body to be saying that you can just waive 403 at the will of the majority of the chamber. Um, that's not that's not a good thing to uh, go forward. And so it would probably be a good idea if at a bare minimum that the majority party uh, at least get together, get their ducks in a row and figure out some other reason or ways that we can address this issue either by allowing them, um, either by allowing an amendment to be done to address that issue, to account for it elsewhere. But we don't wanna be just defining the budget resolution as whatever a majority of the chamber says. And so I would hope that the majority leader would consider that under advisement or Representative Liebling or Representative Pinto. Uh, you can't spend money you don't have. And you certainly, uh, you have the votes to do what you want, but uh, I don't think you guys are gonna want to establish this precedent and you're not gonna want us to do this to you in 2023 when we're in the majority. The representative from Fillmore, Representative Davids. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I hope people are paying attention here. I really hope you're paying very close attention. Majority Leader Winkler recently said, and I'll paraphrase, that there's no good reason to send this back to Ways and Means. Well, I can think of a very good reason. It's called a fiscal note. In my 29 years on this floor, we use fiscal notes. We don't say they're just advisory and go around them. I think Representative Garofalo's counsel here is very, very wise. Let's just slow it down. Last week we got rolled. Masons got rolled. The House Rules got rolled on germaneness issues on amendments. That's one thing. Members, this is quite another. We cannot just, out of convenience, say fiscal notes are advisory. And then Representative Pinto says, he has confidence that we'll address it later. I don't care about his confidence level. I care about this house. I care about the house's rules. That's what I care about. I don't care how confident my good friend Representative Pinto is. That's not the issue at hand. The issue at hand is that this bill is now out of order. It is out of balance, and we must fix it. Members, don't set the precedence in this house by voting red and with the, with the effect that now fiscal notes are advisory. I've never heard of anything like that. Last week was bad enough. Don't start this week out even worse. This needs to be fixed. Whether it goes back to ways and means, just fix it. You got the votes, but don't ram it through being out of balance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have a, a point of order. Please state your point of order. Um, rule 403 relates to uh, the adoption of, of amendments that would throw the bill out of, out of whack. I, I don't think, see that this fiscal note has uh, any relationship uh, to any amendment that is before us. Mr. Speaker, advice. Representative Elkins, we are on a motion to re-refer the bill to, uh, back to Ways and Means. Could you restate your uh, point of order? Well, is the Rule 403 relates to uh, um, adoption of amendments that would throw the, uh, the, the, the bill out of order. There's no amendment. If we you know, uh, accept this point of order and refer the bill back to ways and means, we're saying that uh, any belated untimely fiscal note that came in anywhere in the process could completely derail the process. So I would urge members to vote against this. Uh, 
Representative Elkins, we're, we're not on an amendment. We're on a motion to re-refer. Uh, if you yep. could withdraw your point of order, please. Um, I will withdraw my point of order, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion? The representative from Meeker, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm sorry, I had a question regarding fiscal notes, but uh, I will, uh, def uh, I'm not gonna ask a question now, so I, I pass, thank you. Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think a little bit of clarity on what this motion is and how it applies to our rules and how the fiscal note plays in might be helpful. The bill before us has a, an appropriation to cover a study. It is on lines 850, or page 858, line 26. So based on the fiscal note that's in the that was provided originally, that appropriation was deemed by the committee and the Committee on Ways and Means to cover the amount necessary for the study. A late-breaking fiscal note from an administrative agency does not change the appropriation in the bill, and it cannot force the bill out of order because of a difference of opinion. The conversation about amendments and Rule 4.03 is different. Rule 4.03 says that an amendment cannot be added to a bill that would make the bill violate the budget resolution. This bill does not violate the budget resolution because of a change in fiscal note. We are not on a point of order to an amendment related to 4.03. We are discussing whether or not the appropriation made by the Minnesota House of Representatives is adequate to cover a fiscal note. The motion to re-refer to rules, or sorry, to re-refer to ways and means is a motion that is in order, but re-referring is not necessary because there is an appropriation in the bill to cover the cost. A change in fiscal note does not change the total appropriations in the bill, and therefore it is within the budget resolution. Members, it's time to vote no and, and continue. If uh, members wish to have a conversation about this fiscal note and in some way resolve it within the bill and have an amendment at some point in time in the future, that's still possible. But at this point in time, there is no reason to re-refer this bill to Ways and Means and kill the HHS budget bill at this point in time. Further discussion? Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative Katiza Watoon uh, yield for a question? Rep uh, Representative Katiza Watoon, will you yield for a question? Yes, Mr. Speaker. She will yield. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Katiza Wachoon. I know that, <laughs> I'm sorry that you're getting dragged into this, but I know the original bill language of House File 910 was actually your bill, and I'm wondering if you can tell us if it is the same language now that it was uh, when we got the initial fiscal note. Representative Katiza Wachoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question, Representative New Brindley. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the language is the same. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I, I want to clear up a couple of things. Um, number one, we're, we're being told now that we can disregard a fiscal note when last week uh, we ruled an amendment out of order based on an email. Uh, so this is really odd to begin with. But I would also point out the majority leader just told us that this um, fiscal note came from the agency. We can disregard it. Um, we can have a discussion about it later, but I, I do want to be clear that this fiscal note did not come from the agency. This came from our legislative budget, budget office. Um, certainly, uh, it, it, the agency is not involved with this fiscal note. And I, and I want to be clear, you know, we brought up a report earlier, and in the fiscal note, the report itself has a cost of $70,000. The total cost of the study and the report is, um, it, well, it's actually close to $300,000. There's a little bit of federal money that will cover a portion of that cost, bringing us down to the approximately just shy of $200,000. Um, but there's only a $50,000 appropriation in the bill. So would Representative Liebling uh, yield to a question? Representative Liebling, will you yield to a question? Yes. 
she will yield. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Liebling, I'm wondering if you can tell us how, uh, how DHS will pay for that additional $150,000. Where in their budget might that $150,000 come from? Representative Liebling. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and um, Representative New Brindley. Well, I'm not convinced that there will be an extra need for additional funding. So um, I do think that Representative Winkler explained this very well. Um, the fact that um, somebody has now decided that something, they want more money to pay for something than was, uh, is we are appropriating for it in the bill does not mean that that is going to happen. And I think that members who've been around for a while and have seen a lot of, a lot of um, bills go through the system understand this, that uh, fiscal notes are advisory and, um, and I also don't think there's any magic to the fact that the legislative budget office is uh, doing something. Frankly, this was um, uh, an extra layer of bureaucracy that I have yet to really see what value it adds. And uh, today I'm really wondering what value it adds when we get a fiscal note for something um, just as we're going on the floor with a major bill. Um, so I, I'm not in agreement that we need extra money. So where it would come from, I don't think it's gonna come from anywhere because I don't think it's is needed. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's, it, this is a little odd. This, these are the exact arguments, or I should say these are exactly opposite the arguments that the majority was making last week on bills. Um, like, I forget who said it, but we understand that the majority has the votes and they can do whatever they want. Um, however, know that if you do this, this will be the first time. We do not s send bills out of this body that are not in balance. It just does not happen. We take care of these issues um, before we send a bill out. This will be unprecedented. This will be unprecedented. We have just been told now that in this body, we can disregard fiscal notes. We will, we will accept emails. We will accept emails from someone at an agency for very small costs, $3,000. We will accept that as a reason to not take an amendment to fix a bill. But when we get an official fiscal note, we now are saying in this body right now, if you vote no on sending this bill back to Ways and Means, you are saying that fiscal notes don't matter. Even in the original fiscal note, before we got the revised fiscal note, uh, there was a cost of what, almost 70 million? in the, the original fiscal note, the appropriation in the bill doesn't even cover the cost of the original fiscal note. And yet we're gonna send an omnibus bill out of this chamber that is completely out of balance. Members, this is really easy. This isn't even hard. We don't have to pass this bill today. This bill does not, there is literally no reason we are not at the end of session. We're not pushing up against a deadline. There is literally no reason to send this bill off the House floor out of balance. And it just is, you cannot dispute that. You literally cannot dispute the fact that this bill is out of balance with the House resolution, with the resolution that came out of the Ways and Means Committee. It is out of balance. And if you send this bill off the House floor today, it will be unprecedented and literally for no reason. There is no deadline. We have weeks before the end of session 
We can send this bill back to Ways and Means. It's a pretty simple fix. I mean, you're, you're turning down amendments for a cost of $3,000. This is $150,000. We're going to have to find some money if we want to get this done. But it's $150,000. Surely, surely this bill can be fixed reasonably easily. But I tell you what, if this is how we're going to start our day, and this is how we're going to deal with amendments, if this is going to how we're going to deal with this bill, it's going to be a long day. Members, vote green. The representative from Carver, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was my amendment last week that was ruled out of order because an email from a department said that it might cost them $3,000. And the majority party argued vociferously that that was an inviolable rule that they had to say no. And uh, whether they liked the amendment or not, doesn't matter, costs extra money, Representative Nash, and therefore your amendment is way out of order. I will tell you that we haven't heard from the majority party yet any refutation around the fact that it's going to cost more money. Haven't heard anybody stand up and say, nope, nope, they got it wrong. Uh, we've heard members say that they don't like the legislative budget office, but they haven't said that they got it wrong at the legislative budget office. And I will remind members that the LBO gets base information that they put into their fiscal notes from agencies and departments. That's where they go to get a lot of their research for what's going to happen with something that a fiscal note is generated for. So if you do this, what's going to happen is you're going to say, one, fiscal notes don't matter. Two, as Representative David's pointed out, that the process, procedures, and tenants of our house that we have held for years and years and years are completely editable when you find what we're talking about inconvenient. Now, it's a really nice day out here in Carver County. I was just out at the mailbox uh, as this started and had my headphones on. But you know what I, what I got as I was walking in was this whiff of the stench of hypocrisy once again that I mentioned last week. And I would urge members to uh, support the motion to re-refer because $150,000 is way different than $3,000, a hill that you chose to die on last week for a good amendment that I offered to require a report. Once again, reports are being requested here, but the cost has been clearly shown to be way more than previously. And you are going to, uh, once again, push your members over a cliff, um, a lot like a lemming, to say that you know, you're gonna, we're going to make you take this vote, and uh, we're going to make you uh, change the way this whole house does things. So, members, I would urge you to support the new Brindley motion to re-refer back to Ways and Means. As, as was just pointed out, you've got time left in this session to get your stuff in a pile. This one is way out of balance and should go back to Ways and Means, where you can use your majority votes to do whatever the heck you want. But if you, if you care anything about how process is supposed to happen, you will all vote green and you will send it back to Ways and Means. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I've been listening to this uh, debate and, and uh, troubling is not a word that you know, I use uh, lightly. But what we're talking about here in this chamber is the integrity of our work. And that starts with understanding and making sure that if I were an accountant, things would tie out. Now, we did receive information this morning that said, wait a minute, we have a new piece of information that you should take a look at. A new piece of information that is integral to the financial integrity of this bill. So much so that it's $150,000. I mean, it's not even in the strike zone of the de minimis rule 
that the Chair of Ways and Means has at her discretion. And as has been said by a couple of our members over here, all that we would have to do would be to recess, call an emergency meeting of Ways and Means. We just had a meeting this morning, so I'm sure we're all revved up uh, to go back into Ways and Means, and we can correct and adjust the budget based upon this new information. This is not a hard thing to do, but it is a needful thing to do. If we do anything in this body, it is foundational that we adhere to financial acumen and financial accuracy. What you're basically saying by dismissing this is we don't have to worry about financial accuracy anymore. Doesn't matter. We're close, 150,000, you know, oh, you know, they had it wrong. I have confidence that, you know, it's less than that. Even if it is, it's still out of balance. Members, if you believe in the institution that you have been elected to serve, if you believe in the authenticity of our work and the foundational elements that are incumbent upon us to adhere to and to follow, this is an easy vote. This is not a gotcha. This is a vote to get it right before we send it off this floor. That's all it is. It's nothing more. We're just trying to make sure that what we do here has integrity. That it's done right the first time. Members, please vote in affirmative on the new Brindley motion. The representative from Fillmore, Representative Davids. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. We are in the next few weeks about to see a 900-page HHS bill collide with a 150-page HHS bill. And I'm believing that the bill will come back more than 150 pages. So you, will, you can pass this bill, but let's do it right. That's all we're asking. Let's do it right. If you don't like fiscal notes, get rid of fiscal notes. I happen to believe they're a pretty advantageous tool to do some of these things correctly. So it begs the question, why do we have fiscal notes? What's the point? Well, we do have fiscal notes. We need to slow down here a little bit, members. You can do whatever you want to us. You can stick us every day of the week twice on Sunday. And in the next three weeks, that's what's coming at us on this side. And we know that. We get that. But if you're going to stick us, stick us right. Nail us right. You can't send a bill off this floor that is out of balance, and clearly this is out of balance. Just do the right thing. Slow down a little bit. Back up. Take it to the proper committees. Get it right. I can even figure out how to fix this one. It's not too tough if I can figure it out. Back this thing up, fix it, bring it back, and then we'll pass a bill that's never going to be signed into law. But let's do it right. Seeing no further discussion. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Uh, okay. Representative, new Representative Lucero. Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just realized when I was listening to the discussion here what has happened. I just realized it, it dawned on me. This Democrat majority has abrogated their responsibility to the executive branch for over a year now. They have forgotten their purpose in the House of Representatives, the power of the purse. They have forgotten how to do math. The mental muscles of how to perform computations has been lost by this majority. So I figured I might as well help out a little. So in relation to the $3,000 report that was not permitted 
by this majority and by the same majority that is now in favor of allowing a $150,000 discrepancy. Well, the math is if you take $150,000 divided by $3,000, you get 50. So 50 represents 5,000%. So this majority is about to permit, if they follow their leader, this Democrat majority is about to vote to allow a discrepancy in 5,000% magnitude of the discrepancy that they did not allow just a week and a half ago. Members, we need to return to our constitutional role as the legislative branch and specifically the House of Representatives where the power of the purse resides and not just pass bills that aren't paid for. You know, I heard a phrase many years ago that has been relevant every day that I've heard it. And it's certainly relevant now. And that is never underestimate one's ability to rationalize. No matter how far afield, no matter how out of bounds, no matter how crazy something seems, never underestimate one's ability to rationalize their ability to ignore the truth. And that's what we've seen here with the majority leader's instructions. So Ms., uh, Mr. Speaker and members, don't contort yourself into a pretzel to deny reality. We absolutely must vote green on the, the uh, New Brindley motion. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Moran. Please state your point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, to the point, um, Mr. Speaker, members, I would just like to state that um, <clears throat> when this bill was in the Ways and Means, it was certified. It was certified that it was in balance. It was in balance when it left Ways and Means per paragraph G of Rule 4.03 with the best information I had at that time, which did not include this fiscal note because it didn't exist. Now that the bill is on the floor, paragraph H or rule 4.03 governs the bill, which only says that amendments cannot put the bill out of balance. Mr. Speaker. Further discussion, seeing um, the representative from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would the majority leader yield for a question? He will yield, Representative Garofalo. Uh, Mr. Speaker and, and Majority Leader Winkler, um, you have many avenues available to you to pass this bill today uh, under our rules. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there can be an amendment drafted for the bill uh, to change that. The minority party can help you. You can walk across the House floor. You can go over to Greg Davids and ask him for a check for $150,000. He, he has the money. He can, he can afford it. Uh, you can um, delete this portion of the bill and then just pass the report by itself um, later. Um, I believe you understand the math involved here that this, this bill is in violation of our budget resolution. As long as we're able to pass this bill today, is it fair that we can address this issue rather than passing it out of balance? Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, I think Representative Garofalo ended with a question about is it fair? Uh, I think it is fair to have an honest discussion about what the standards we're applying here are. Most of the debate we've had today has been about whether an amendment would be in order if it were out of balance because it would be adding cost to a bill that's already come out of ways and means. That is not the issue in front of us. The issue in front of us is whether the appropriation in the bill is sufficient to cover the cost of the program. There is late breaking information about what that cost might be. I believe uh, Representative Pinto, because this is just coming in the, at the last minute, has been able to 
uh, dive in a little bit deeper into the fiscal note, but the question is not whether or not the, the, an amendment would put the bill out of order under 4.03. The question is whether the appropriation is adequate in the bill. We have some difference of opinion among the people who provide fiscal notes as to the total cost. At this point in time, the bill is in balance. The bill appropriates the amount of money assigned to it under the, the uh, budget resolution. It is in balance, and there is no reason to make a change at this point in time. Further investigation into that fiscal note is in order, but the fiscal note doesn't make the whole bill out of balance. So the fair thing to do would be to be clear with the body about what exactly you're arguing on behalf of this motion to re-refer to the Committee on Ways and Means. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the Majority Leader would yield for another question. He will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Majority Leader, um, Mr. Majority Leader, my opinion is that when a bill leaves ways and means and an updated fiscal note shows an additional cost beyond what was appropriated in ways and means, that the bill is out of balance. Uh, is your opinion that it is not? Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, Representative Garofalo, my opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. The bill is in balance because it appropriates the same amount of money that the budget resolution calls for. Representative Garofalo. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the majority leader would yield for another question. He will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Majority, or damn it, Represent Majority Leader Winkler, the, uh, the question I'm trying to ask you is that when new information comes available after the Ways and Means Committee, through our fiscal note process, does that information, is it relevant to the floor debate? Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, Representative Garofalo, a change in a fiscal note doesn't put the whole bill out of balance. It, it, when you say, does it affect our floor debate, it does if it's coming forward in the form of an amendment. The point here is that fiscal notes can change later on in the process too. A conference committee could find out that there's a different fiscal note and that wouldn't put the bill out of balance in the House and Senate and have to send the bills back because they're out of balance in conference. The point is there is multiple steps through this process. This bill left ways and means with an appropriation that is consistent with the budget resolution. It continues to have an appropriation consistent with the budget resolution. And that's all there is to discuss here. Um, if the majority leader would yield for another question. He will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Majority Leader Winkler. Um, well, first of all, the budget resolution doesn't apply to conference committee reports. So no one's disputing that. That's what the rules say. So that, does, that's, that argument means nothing. What we're trying to figure out here is that your guys' perspective is that when new information becomes available after Ways and Means, if it puts a bill out of balance or not. The fiscal note does say that it spends more money than was accounted for in the Ways and Means process. Representative Moran just said that, that when it left Ways and Means, everything was paid for. The fiscal note came out, it cost more money. So does that information matter? And that's, that's really the, the crutch, crutch of what we're trying to understand. If you're saying that when the fiscal notes change after ways and means and before the floor debate, it doesn't matter, then just say it. If it does matter, then tell us that and we'll help you address the issue today. But I don't recall us ever seeing a fiscal note and saying, well, because it was, this bill passed uh, a week ago, well, the new information is irrelevant that somehow we blind ourselves to that. So you just please explain to us your opinion of what you believe the relevance of budget resolution of the the fiscal note process is between ways and means on the House floor. Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, Representative Garofalo, fiscal notes can change over the course of budget negotiations during the time we are passing budget bills. If a fiscal note comes in during third reading of a bill, a budget bill, it doesn't mean that the bill is out of order and has to be sent back to ways and means doesn't mean it has to be amended. It is in order because the appropriation is within the budget resolution. Is there a question about the fiscal note and whether at a point in time in the future, either the fiscal note will have to be adjusted, there have to be further conversation with the agency, an appropriation might have to be changed, the language might have to be changed, all of those things are possible. But based on a fiscal note alone, a budget bill is not out of balance and need to be sent back to committee. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker and uh, Majority Leader Winkler, um, I, I think the message, whether you are attempting to communicate it or not today, 
is that the budget resolution is whatever the majority party says it is. And that the number two plus two can equal five if that's what the majority party says it is. Um, I don't understand why you guys just don't fix this within our rules. I don't know why you guys have to violate the rules to spend the money. Um, I will encourage members to vote to send this bill to Ways and Means. Um, for members on my side of the aisle, uh, please don't think that this is okay. You know, at some point you're going to be in the majority and you may be willing to think that because Representative Winkler and the DFL did this that it's all right. Um, it's not. It's not okay. Um, by taking the budget resolution process and throwing it into a shredder, uh, it debases the entire institution. Again, the budget resolution does not apply to bills that come back from conference committee. Um, that's not what the purpose of it is. This is a mechanism for us to make sure that we're paying for uh, the spending that we're proposing uh, in our chamber. So I would uh, ask members to support the, uh, the re-referral motion, uh, and I would ask members of the DFL, either privately or publicly, to have a more honest conversation about what it is, uh, what it is you're going to be accounting for with our accounting practices going forward. Um, this, is a, this is a bad idea, and whether you're sending the bill to committee uh, or whether you address it with an amendment later, the better thing to do is to fix this problem and just try to redefine reality because you have 68 votes. Thank you. The representative from Olmstead, Representative Qualm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And translating for the general public, we are required to have a balanced budget. So just like in your household, if you say this much for groceries, this much for the car, this much, et cetera, that's sort of what the committee does, simplified. So you have $100 a week to buy groceries. You put $100 in your pocket or purse, you go to the grocery store, and the total is 110, but you only got $100. Well, you either put back something or you go home and get more. We're asking the chamber to go back home, adjust the budget if it needs to be, and do it right. You know, a silly thing like being required to have a balanced budget requires us to do the process. You at home go through similar processes and that's what we're arguing about here. If we just ignore the fact that our budget isn't balanced and something costs more, unfortunately, you at that checkout counter can't miraculously get your stuff anyway. We at the government apparently can. So I would hope everybody would vote green and act like our citizens and constituents and do the balanced thing. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, I think there's a, there's a fundamental misunderstanding at the heart of this, and my apologies if I've contributed to it in my responses to the questions from Representative Garofalo, um, because Representative Garofalo in questioning uh, uh, Leader Winkler had talked about uh, if a bill is approved in ways and means when a fiscal note comes out with a higher cost, but actually, members, this is the exact opposite situation. The fiscal note that came out this morning is less than the fiscal note that was on this bill when it was approved in Ways and Means. It's a lesser amount. Um, and maybe as a sign of how, uh, how fiscal notes are not uh, uh, science and not uh, precise, that without any change to the bill language, it's actually uh, more than $150,000 less um, than, the, than that original fiscal note. Uh, but in any case, that fiscal note was in existence when the bill was approved in Ways and Means. It had the appropriation in the bill, the language was there, and our fiscal committee, Ways and Means, approved the bill. The fact that a fiscal note comes out this morning with a lesser cost than what is approved in Ways and Means, I think kind of um, eliminates a lot of the discussion that we've been having. There's no reason to send it back to assess uh, uh, this lesser fiscal note. We should move on and vote green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. Further discussion? Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I appreciate Representative Pinto trying to clarify some things because I do think that um, there has been a lot of sort of off uh, information in this conversation. Um, and, and number one, I, I'm, would Representative Moran yield to a question? Representative Moran, will you yield to a question? 
Yes. She will yield. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it is in Rule 4.03G. It says the Ways and Means must reconcile finance and rev revenue bills with the resolution. That's the resolution that comes out of Ways and Means. It's the budget, the, those overarching numbers. And I'm wondering, Representative Moran, if you can tell us a little bit about what process is used to make sure that, um, that the finance and revenue bills are reconciled with the resolution. Representative Moran. Mr. Speaker and member to Representative um, New Brinkley, I, I would like to state that um, in uh, paragraph three, a G of rules uh, four of three, that um, again, with the best information that was um, had at that time, which did not include any fiscal note of amendment because it did not exist, that it was appropriate and still is appropriate that um, it is in balance. Um, but I think before the body right now that the appropriation amount in the bill is what matters at this moment, that the appropriation amount in the bill it is what matters. And the spreadsheet from the House Fiscal shows that the total spending match perfectly with the target in the resolution. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Representative Moran. Um, I, I, I would, would Representative Moran yield to another question? Representative Moran, will you yield? Yes. She will yield, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, Bill, I, I'm, I'm wondering, the bill language, the appropriation in the bill clearly does not reconcile with, um, with the cost explained in the fiscal note. So Representative Moran, can you tell us how you reconcile those discrepancies? Representative Moran. Um, Mr. Speaker and Representative New Brittany. And so I, I still want to go back and then just state that um, uh, I was able to certify the bill in ways and means. It is in line with rule four, uh, in, in paragraph three of rule 4.03. Um, that is still appropriate. And that in um, paragraph H of rule 4.03 governs, governs the bill which only says that amendments cannot put the bill out of balance. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Representative Moran, we're not talking about an amendment right now. That would be under paragraph H. We are talking about uh, the bill itself uh, being reconciled in, uh, in the Ways and Means Committee, and which it clearly is not. It, it, interestingly, I mean, I guess I should say thank you to the majority for now making the point that we made last week. Last week, we made the point um, that costs mattered, not just the appropriation in the bill. Um, or I should say, we made the point that the appropriation was already funded and that there was enough money in the appropriation to cover the bill. You're making the opposite point now. Um, it's, it's very strange. And I guess there's been a, a, some confusion as well, and, and I apologize as, as Representative Pinto, I, I appreciate that. Um, there's been some confusion, and would Representative Pinto yield to a question? Representative Pinto, will you yield for a question? Yes, I will, Mr. Speaker. He will yield. Brindley. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, I, I, well, first of all, I will, I will offer some clarity. I, I actually have the original fiscal note from, from April 8th here. And in this fiscal note, it says that there is a general fund cost to the Human Services Department of $197,000. 
In, and then I have the fiscal note that came out today, this morning, and it has a general fund cost to the Department of Health and Human Services, or to the Department of Human Services of $197,000. So that cost did not decrease. And of course, as we know, the general fund is what we're talking about when we're looking at the budget resolution. Um, and so I'm wondering, Representative Pinto, if you can tell us, one, uh, what you are looking at when you're talking about the cost decreasing. Let's start with that question. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative New Brindley, thanks so much for pointing that out. I think you've actually made my point even, even better. So first of all, to answer your question, uh, the, the note had uh, reflected costs uh, in, uh, in other departments, in, in the education department as well. And again, I think it was a, a misunderstanding of the, um, of the language. But in any case, you are correct, though, that the, health, that the human services cost stays the same. But Representative New Brindley, I'll then point out to you even more than that our Ways and Means Committee had the fiscal note, approved the bill as is. That is our fiscal committee that passes muster on bills. And they approved it. And as you say, so when I'm talking about the, de about the decrease, I'm talking about the total cost uh, in, uh, in several areas. And again, without the language changing, the total cost dropped by uh, more than 150,000, thus showing again that it's, uh, there can be, uh, uh, this is more of an art uh, uh, than a science in terms of the advice that's being provided to us in our role, because uh, of course we get the final say. Um, but I will note that the uh, general fund human services portion of this, as you say, that part did in fact stay the same, and that has already been approved by Ways and Means. So for that reason alone, there'd be no reason to send this bill back to Ways and Means so they can simply approve the thing that they already approved uh, a week and a half ago whenever it was in Ways and Means. Representative Newbrinley. Would Representative Pinto yield to another question? Representative Pinto, will you yield? I will. He will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Representative Pinto. Um, and there were a lot of words there, and I appreciate that. But I'm wondering, the cost didn't change. Um, the cost was 197000 on April 8th. On April 12th, this bill was adopted into the committee report with an appropriation of $50,000. And now, and now we have a new, uh, or a, a fiscal note this morning confirming the $197,000 cost. But yet there's only a $50,000 appropriation in the bill when there is almost $200,000 in cost. And I'm wondering, Representative Pinto, who told you that the cost would only be $50,000 instead of the $197,000? Representative Pinto. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Well, I mean, I guess the, the real question, I suppose, Representative New Brindley, is for those members who are on the Ways and Means Committee, um, that committee, our fiscal committee, approved the bill uh, as is with that, uh, with the appropriation to human services uh, being in the amount that it is, with, again, the, the cost as a whole being less than when the, when the committee approved that. Um, and so, uh, you know, the nature of, the, um, of this, again, this is a report on children in foster care and child care. Um, and uh, I think there's, uh, uh, there's very, um, uh, there's good reason uh, to, to, uh, to believe that such a report, uh, that that's an appropriate amount. But here's the thing, Representative New Brindley, my opinion doesn't matter and, and yours doesn't matter either, I suppose, at this point. Um, you're making a motion to refer this bill back to the committee whose opinion does matter, and they've already spoken and they've approved this bill uh, and this provision and this amount as is. So that, to my mind, is the real question, and it's already been answered. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Pinto yield for one more question? I'm guessing yes. Representative Pinto, will you yield? I will, Mr. Speaker. He will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Pinto. We were told that there was a lower cost in the new fiscal note for the report. Um, and I am not seeing that. Can you please direct me towards that information? Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative New Brindley, and again, I may have been a little bit um, confused earlier um, uh, talking to Representative Garofalo, but, um, but as you're looking at the notes, if you have them in front of you, Representative New Brindley, the total cost over four years with two biennia adds up to roughly $470,000 in the original fiscal note. Um, it adds up to uh, $316,000 
uh, over just one biennium and the second biennium there's no cost. So that's a drop from 473,000 to, to 316,000. And that Representative Brindley explains the drop. Again, members, when you're thinking about this, uh, as you're deciding at any point, both in this and the future, recognize that this is actually a cheaper cost than when it was approved in, in ways and means cheaper overall, the same cost for general fund for human services. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I had to giggle a little bit that we were just told that the original cost was roughly $70,000 and the new cost is roughly $68,000. So we are about $2,000 closer to balance, I suppose. But um, that, that struck my funny bone. So thank you for that. Um, and, I, and I apologize because this is being kicked back to ways and means. Would Representative Moran yield to another question? Representative Moran, will you yield? Yes. She will yield. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Moran, um, I, will, I will ask this question of you because your colleague punted to Ways and Means. On April 8th, a fiscal note came out saying that there would be a cost of $197,000 to this bill. On, on April 12th, it was uh, passed in the committee report up to Ways and Means. Today, there was a cost again, and excuse me, on, in that committee report, it was given a $50,000 appropriation. And then today, again, it was confirmed that the cost is actually $197,000. So I'm, I'm wondering, Representative Moran, if you can tell us what information or data did you use to reconcile that, that $50,000 appropriation with the $197,000 cost? Representative Moran. Uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Newt Brintley, uh, <clears throat> it is the judgment of the legislature how much to spend based on the fiscal note. And if a bill appropriates a specific amount of money for a provision, that is the prerogative of the legislature and the appropriation is static, regardless of a new fiscal note. Because we put a specific number in the bill, that number doesn't change from a new fiscal note. And a spreadsheet doesn't change from a new fiscal note. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, that tickles my funny bone a little bit. Um, we were just told that the legislature, we can decide if the money is enough or not. So I don't know, what does that mean? That as a legislature, we can say, well, we know Department of Education that you are telling us that it costs tens of billions of dollars to educate our kids. But you know what? We actually don't believe you. And we think that um, $10 million should do it. Like, what is this? How are we making decisions? The response we just got is crazy. That's like, that's like me telling my electric company, and I appreciate Representative Kwan bringing this back to really simple terms. You know, when I make a family budget at my house, I have those fixed items, right? I've got my mortgage payment, um, car payment, different things that are fixed, and then I've got you know variable expenses. My food budget adjusts a little bit each month. My electricity cost goes up and down each month a little bit. This is like, this is like my electric company telling me that I owe them $200, and I say, oh no, I am appropriating $100 for you. So that's going to have to, that's gonna have to do. That will have to uh, solve your problem here. What? That is literally what we were just told. That the legislature can appropriate whatever we want, regardless of what the actual cost is. Mm -hmm. This discussion has gone so far afield from reality at this point. I'm gonna read it again. This is really simple. After the adoption of a resolution by the Committee on Ways and Means, which has been done, the Committee on Ways and Means must reconcile finance and revenue, revenue bills with the resolution. Frankly, Representative Moran, you were wrong when you certified to the House that it was reconciled. It was, 
We don't even care. We don't care who's to blame. We don't care that this is a simple problem to fix. It's not a big deal. As I said, let's just fix it. Let's just fix it. This bill was already sent back to Ways and Means last week. And when it was sent back to Ways and Means, they both, um, they both changed the budget resolution. They amended the budget, budget resolution because they had to do that to make, it, uh, to make it work, to make it in balance. And then they also fixed the bill. Because that's what we do. That's what we do in this body. When we know that there's a mistake, we do not send a bill off this floor out of balance when we know it is out of balance. Members, understand that if you vote no, this is unprecedented. We do not send bills out of the House chamber out of balance. I mean, we know that the majority that the DFL majority has completely thrown the rules out the window this year, as is evidenced by the debate we're having right now. We know that, you know, we're gonna misuse germaneness, we're gonna misuse these rules all day long. We get that that's the DFL playbook this year, but this is different. This is different. This is the House body, this is, this is, the House saying, hey, we know that this is the cost. We don't have quite enough money to pay that cost, but we're going to do it anyway. We have a balanced budget amendment in this state. It is in our state constitution that our budget must be balanced. And if we send a bill off the House floor today, that is not in balance, it will be unprecedented. We do not do this. It's so clear, we couldn't get an answer. However, the information that the committee had on April 8th was that there was $197,000 cost to this study and report. On the 12th, the committee adopted a committee report with only a $50,000 appropriation. We can't get an answer as to why that was. Nobody is telling us, well, they have this data, this information that says the cost is actually lower. It's actually only going to cost $50,000, and this is how we know that. No, we don't have that. They just don't want to do the $197,000, so they put $50,000 in. What are we doing? This is so easy. There is no deadline that we are up against. This bill is not in conference. There is literally no reason to not send this bill back to Ways and Means, fix it, and bring it back to the floor. No reason. The only reason we would not do that is because the, D the pride of our DFL counterparts won't allow it. It doesn't even matter. It's so easy to fix this. Send it back to Ways and Means. Amend the budget resolution. You can do that. You can amend the budget resolution. You can fix the bill. You can add an appropriation. You can change the language of the bill to reduce the cost. There are lots of options. It's easy to do. So just do it. Members, vote yes. Send this back to Ways and Means. Fix the bill. And do not change what we have done in this body. The way we work. I, I, I thought there was a time that we worked with integrity in this body. This is, this is unbelievable what we're doing right now. Send the, vote, send the bill back to Ways and Means. We can get this fixed, bring it back to the floor. Easy solutions. Please vote green on the motion to send the bill back to Ways and Means.
Seeing no further discussion on the New Brindley motion to re-refer the bill to Ways and Means, the clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. The clerk will call the names of those members who haven't voted yet. Feist. Feist. Gr Green. Feist, nay. Feist, no. Green. Green, I. Green, I. Hanson, R. Hanson, R, no. Hanson, R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hertos. Hertas. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Nash. Nash, yes. Nash, I. Novotny. Novotny, I. Pinto. Pinto, no. Pinto, no. Sandell. Sandell, no. Sandell, no. Scott. Yes. Scott I. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski I. Swazinski I. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Erdahl. Erdahl I. Wolgamot. Wolgamot, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. Mr. Speaker, point of order. State your point of order. Mr. Speaker, I rise to a point of order that under uh, four point, Rule 4.03G, after the adoption of a resolution by the Committee on Ways and Means, the Committee on Ways and Means must reconcile finance and revenue bills with the resolution. This bill is out of balance and therefore not reconciled properly and it is out of order. Advice. Advice. Advice for the speaker. Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you find the New Brindley point of order not well taken. This is essentially the same vote on the same issue twice. Any further advice? I have taken advice from Representatives New Brindley and from Representative Winkler, and I find the advice not well taken. Mr. Speaker, I, appeal, I appeal the ruling of the Speaker and request a roll call. Roll call having been, re been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The question before the body is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker. A no or red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. The clerk will take the roll. Can we speak to the motion, oh, Mr. I'm speaker? I'm sorry. 
Yes, Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, would Representative uh, Moran yield to a question? Representative Moran, will you yield? Yes. She will yield. Representative New Brindley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So last week, uh, we had a debate on the floor. There was an appropriation in the bill. However, uh, someone at an agency indicated that there would be additional cost. It would cost an additional $3,000 beyond what, that, what was given in the appropriation. The appropriation was based on uh, fiscal data. Um, so today we have a situation where there is an appropriation for $50,000. But the actual costs, we're being told, are $197,000. So I'm wondering, Representative Moran, can you tell us, can you tell the body um, what information you used to determine that a $50,000 appropriation was okay rather than the $197,000 that the fiscal note indicated was necessary? Representative Moran. Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative New Brinkley and members, um, <clears throat> I will go back to as this bill left out of ways and means and state that because we put a specific number in the bill, that number doesn't change from a new fiscal note and the spreadsheet doesn't change from a new fiscal note. That 3,000 cost was in a minute not the underlying bill. If this was a concern when the bill was in ways and means, member could have raised the concern then, but there was no objections to this appropriation by the members of any caucus. Rep Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thankfully, the majority spent plenty of time talking this morning and gave us plenty of time to review the fiscal notes and the history of what happened here, um, which, which allowed us the time to investigate and figure out that this bill was indeed out of balance. And I see that we're not getting an answer, actually, on why costs actually don't matter now. Last week, we were told that costs are the only thing that matters. This week, we're being told that costs don't matter at all. It's just the appropriation. That's what matters. We're not getting an answer on how we determine whether or not a finance, the finance and revenue bills are reconciled with the resolution. We're not getting any actual answers. It is incredibly disappointing that no one is even paying attention to this debate right now. I mean, Representative Doubt, Leader Doubt talked last week about everyone hiding under their desks. Well, right now, everyone's eyes are forward. Heaven forbid we actually engage in this kind of conversation. Heaven forbid we care about the integrity of this institution. Literally, not a single person is even looking, is even watching what is going on right now. Boy, I wish that those who watch at home, and I'm always surprised that there are those, but boy, do I wish that people could see what was happening right now. Because, because if we were engaged and we were paying attention, I actually do have faith in my colleagues across the aisle. I actually do believe that they are people of integrity and that they are here for the right reason. And I believe if they were paying attention, they would care about the integrity of this of Point this of order, motion. Mr. Speaker. Please state your point of order. Mr. Speaker, Representative New Brindley is consistently raising issues of motives and personalities in this discussion on an appeal of a ruling that the body has already decided in the last motion that she brought. She's out of order. Members, please keep the discussion to the motion before us, which is the uh, appeal of the ruling of the speaker. Representative New Brindley. Mr. Speaker, thank you. And, and I apologize. I didn't realize that giving credit to my colleagues was also out of order. Um, I, will, I, I don't like the idea of being less kind in the future, but perhaps I will be less generous in my comments. Um, but to be clear, 
the, the motion that we already voted on was to send the bill back to Ways and Means. That was voted down by the body. So now we are actually voting to appeal the ruling of the speaker because we actually do believe that this motion um, or this, this bill is, is not properly reconciled, that it's out of balance. Those are two different things. So the body decided not to send it back to Ways and Means, and now we are on a point of order, just to be clear what we're talking about. Um, and, I, and like I said, I do believe actually in the integrity of my colleagues, and if, and if folks were paying attention and um, engaged in the debate, I think that they would choose to vote with me today, and they would vote no to overturn the ruling of the speaker. And that is, that is what I would ask when this bill is so clearly out of balance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Wright, Representative Cerro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I was listening to the chair of May's Ways and Means uh, speak in both the previous motion and in this motion several times now, uh, we've all heard the chair say the Leg uh, this body is the one who determines how much we're going to appropriate for a requirement. And regardless of what the fiscal note says, she's continuing to advocate that what has been uh, allocated is enough when we know it is not enough. And so for those who've been around, we know what comes next year. But for those first term members, many in the majority party, let me explain what comes next year in the off year. And that is supplementary budget requests from state agencies. And that is where there has been an unexpected additional amount of money spent beyond what was appropriated, they need to make up that gap. And so what we are seeing here, if this bill were to pass and become law as written, the chair of Ways and Means has stated, we're going to allocate $50,000 for something that is going to cost $200,000. That's deficit spending. And so we would be setting up a situation where guaranteed next year, we are mandating an action and we are not appropriating enough funds to cover the actions. And therefore, we know they will be coming to us next year with a supplementary budget request. Members, we don't want that. Why would we do that? We don't want to do that. We want to fix it, or at least we should fix it. And that's why we absolutely need to vote red because the speaker got this ruling wrong. Vote red, members. Thank you. Members, the question before the body is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker. A no or red vote goes against the speaker. The clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Draskowski. Draskowski, no. Draskowski, no. Hanson R. Hanson R. I. Hanson R. I. Houseman. Houseman I. Houseman I. Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Heinrich, no. Hertas. Hertas. Mason. Mason. Mason I. Mason I. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Nash. Nash, no. Nash, no. Novotny. 
Novotny, no. Pinto. Pinto, aye. Pinto, aye. Sandin. Aye. Sandin, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, no. Swazinski, no. Wazlowick. Wazlowick, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 61 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. <laughs>